Good morning, or indeed wherever it is around the world that you we are greeting you from to this uh, this webinar on blue carbon. Apologies for a few minor technical issues at the beginning. Um, my uh, name is Charles Clover, and I'm executive director of Blue Marine Foundation, and your host today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded on Zoom and going out on YouTube, so you can see it again at leisure. First up is a short introduction to what we will be talking about today. The ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. Throughout human history, it has fed us and transported us around the world. Now we're looking to the ocean to address the greatest threat we have ever faced we find ourselves at a pivotal moment. The world is waking up to climate change and the ocean's role in fixing it. And now we know what we need to do. We must redouble our efforts and raise our ambitions to protect and restore key carbon sinking habitats and the ocean system as a whole. We must also find ways to recognize the ocean's true value as a huge engine of nature-based solutions to climate change. A healthy, intact ocean thriving at full potential will fix more carbon. If we save the ocean, the ocean will save us. Blue Carbon, nature-based solutions on a grand scale. Well, thank you for joining us today to consider this huge subject, which is of accelerating importance. A high-level panel uh, said two years ago that ocean-based actions could deliver a fifth of the mitigation needed to hold global temperatures to 1.5 degrees uh, by 2050. That's the same as potentially as shutting down all the coal-fired power stations in the world. New urgency has been injected into this debate this year by the Nature paper led by one of our speakers, suggesting that trawling is producing the same amount of carbon emissions as the global aviation industry, which is itself already a free rider unchecked on the Earth's climate system. I have to say that the Blue Marine Foundation was not the first into this space. We stand on the shoulders of the Blue Carbon Initiative, which includes giants like UNESCO, IUCN and Conservation International. But now we, like many other medium-sized uh, NGOs, find that blue carbon is being talked about in all our projects, not just in terms of mangroves, salt, salt marsh or seagrass, but in terms of the seabed itself. So it is now of interest to our whole organization and across our projects across the world, uh, talking blue carbon strengthens the case for the protection of nature in the sea. And that's what we at Blue try to do. This webinar is the, web, is the brainchild of Dan Crockett, Blue Marine Foundation's Director of Development, who many of you will know and have spoken to. Hats off to Dan for topicality. He organized it because it seemed to us that everyone was asking the same questions within their own organizations without necessarily coming up with the same answers publicly. So there is a need to learn from one another and to coordinate. There are roughly four questions we think we would like to try and answer over the course of today, just in case you can keep those in mind. Number one, can the ocean make a greater contribution to saving the world from climate change than we had planned hitherto? I suspect we all think the answer is yes to that. Number two, if we can devise nature-based solutions to climate change in the sea, where should we start? What's the low-hanging fruit? 
Astonishingly, the UK government doesn't yet seem to have a strategy on this, despite claiming to be in the lead on climate change and being host of COP26. Number three, we are protecting lots of marine habitat for biodiversity, finally, and a little belatedly. Are these the same habitats we should be protecting for carbon saving? Are there synergies there between carbon saving and biodiversity? We think there are. Fourth and lastly, the question is, is there a credible way of selling the carbon benefits these schemes soak up as credits? It's not hard to think of whole industries that are going to need them. Just look up in the sky. So uh, we look forward to your answers uh, to these questions. This is what we have lined up for you today to stimulate these answers further. We have a very distinguished UK government speaker who will give his thoughts on this topic. We have a very senior international speaker who's going to tell us about one of the largest mangrove restoration projects in the world. Then we have some experts who will be speaking in person, who you'll be able to ask questions uh, in, to, in two panels. Please get stuck in on the chat as soon as you like and use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for the speakers. The hashtag for the event on social media is hashtag blue carbon, and you will have the opportunity to get more involved and have those important conversations you want in the breakouts this afternoon. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, someone who understands these matters more than most and cares passionately about them. He is the former editor of The Ecologist. He is now Lord Goldsmith. He is the International Environment Minister. He's speaking to us today following the government's recently announced response to the Banyan Review, which set out plans to designate pilot highly protected marine areas by next year. That is welcome news. By setting aside some areas of the sea with high levels of protection, HPMAs will allow nature to recover to a more natural state, allowing this ecosystem to thrive in the absence of damaging activities. Those are Zach's words himself. So Zach, over to you. Thank you so much, Charles, and thank you for the extraordinary work that you've done to protect and restore our ocean. You'll be hearing directly from brilliant scientists, conservationists and campaigners. So it's a real privilege to have been asked to say a few words myself about why protecting and restoring the health of our ocean is not only essential in and of itself, but how doing so can help us tackle so many other problems that we face. The ocean plays a unique, irreplaceable role in regulating our climate. It provides the oxygen in every second breath we take, a gigantic carbon sink. It's absorbed around 30% of the CO2 that we've emitted and more than 90% of the excess heat. And it underpins the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people around the world. You consider that more than a quarter of people in Latin America live in coastal areas and their economies can reflect that very profoundly. It's estimated that around a billion people depend on fish as their main source of protein. So it's hard to exaggerate the importance of the ocean. One way or another, we all depend on its health. And yet in so many ways, we're causing untold harm to it. In my lifetime, marine wildlife has halved. A third of marine mammals are at risk of extinction. Half of coastal wetlands have been lost in the last century. And just as quickly as we're denuding the ocean of life, we're filling it with plastic. And meanwhile, 2% of ocean oxygen has been lost in the last 60 years. Marine heat waves have become twice as frequent in the last 30 years. And the rate of ocean acidification that we're seeing now is unprecedented in the last 65 million years. If there's a single litmus test for how our warmer, more acidic ocean is faring right now, it's corals, on which around a quarter of marine species and hundreds of millions of people depend for food and for coastal protection. Now, we've been warned that we stand to lose 99% of our corals if we allow temperatures to increase by two degrees. And tragically, it goes on and on. And although we can see much of the damage 
and the consequences, our knowledge of ocean systems, in particular in relation to our climate, is patchy at best. So while, for example, we know that bottom trawling has utterly devastated whole tracts of ocean floor, we do not yet know the full extent of its impacts in terms of carbon. Though the brilliant Enric Siler believes that trawling causes the same level of emissions as the aviation sector, and if that's even nearly true, to step up our research and fast. And I'm delighted that the amazing team at CFAS are publishing a new report on blue carbon, and that the G7 have committed to supporting the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. But we do know enough already to be confident that we must urgently increase our efforts both to protect and restore the ocean environment on an unprecedented scale. And the single most important action we can take at COP26 for the ocean is to work towards the goals of the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions and limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And we know that there is no pathway to net zero or indeed to the sustainable development goals that does not involve protecting and restoring nature really on a massive scale. Globally, nature-based solutions, including mangroves, seagrasses, salt marshes, as well as, of course, forests and peatlands, could provide a third of the most cost-effective mitigation that we need during this decade, as well as paying their way many times over, protecting communities from the impacts of climate change, supporting sustainable livelihoods, and helping nature recover. But despite that huge potential, nature attracts less than 3% of global climate finance and less than 1% is allocated to supporting a sustainable ocean economy. And that makes no sense at all. So as presidents of COP and G7 this year, we're putting nature at the heart of our response to climate change and we're pressing for more investment in nature-based solutions, including in relation to the ocean. And at the end of 2019, the UK Prime Minister announced that the UK would be doubling our international climate finance to £11.6 billion. And he has since committed, even more importantly in my view, to investing at least £3 billion of that in nature-based solutions to climate change. And we're urging other donor countries to do something similar. And as part of that, we are about to launch our new £500 million Blue Planet Fund, which will support some of the world's most fragile ocean environments and the communities that rely on them. It'll help countries to establish and improve marine protected areas. It will protect fragile habitats like corals and support restoration of key ecosystems like mangroves. It'll tackle unsustainable and illegal fishing and it'll fight pollution. The new fund builds on work that we're already doing. The magnificent Blue Belt program, for example, now protects an area of ocean larger than India around our overseas territories. Again, thank you, Charles, Adrian, and many others for helping make that happen. We're coordinating and co-leading a global alliance to protect at least 30% of the world's land and ocean by 2030. And I was delighted that all the G7 members have now committed to that target, both domestically and internationally. We're also pushing for effective international mechanisms that will enable us to protect the two thirds of the global ocean that lie beyond national jurisdiction. And incidentally, we know that marine protection works simply because we can measure the results. Wherever MPAs have been established, populations have recovered and fishing communities have directly benefited. Waters could improve global catches by at least 20%, which is a win-win by any measure. The G7 also committed to strengthening support for Aura uh, to build resilience in regions that are most at risk and get $500 million of investment into coastal and marine nature-based solutions by 2030. And critically, to securing a rapid conclusion to World Trade Organization negotiations on fisheries subsidies, because our efforts will be in vain unless we identify and redirect incentives that are driving destruction. And in the run-up to COP26, we're calling on all the multilateral development banks, including banks like the World Bank, to mainstream nature across their entire portfolios and to support countries in fulfilling their commitments to the Leaders' Pledge for Nature. There is no point having bits of investment here 
and bits there in nature or climate if the rest of the portfolios are taking us in the opposite direction. Now, at this point, no government can honestly claim to be doing enough. The gap between where we are now and where we need to be is vast, and closing it is the defining challenge of our age, dwarfing all others. And it won't be achieved through a piecemeal approach. As Professor Dasgupta's seminal study made plain, we need to reconcile our economies with the natural world on which we all depend. And that means learning how to value valuable things like ecosystems and attach a cost to waste, pollution and plunder. But the UK will continue to step up at home and around the world to make this the year we reset our relationship with nature. We have all the tools we need. All that remains is the political will. Thank you so much for inviting me today and I wish you well for the remainder of the conference. Thank you, Zach. Um, that was quite inspiring. Thank you. Um, next up, we have the uh, Chief Minister Syed Murad Ali Shah from the Sindh province of Pakistan. He is going to tell us about the largest mangrove restoration project in the world. We are then going to follow on without introductions into our succession of expert speakers starting with Carlos Duarte of Kaust University in Saudi Arabia. Following that, there will be a panel discussion chaired by James Cameron from Pollination, who many of you will know as a veteran of carbon discussions. Uh, over to you, Chief Minister. The government of Sindh is committed to playing a leading role in combating the negative impacts of climate change Increasing population pressure, compounded by the continued effects of global warming, are putting the vast areas of mangrove forest and precious tidal wetlands in a province at risk. The Indus Delta region is home to a unique and varied biodiversity. It sustains productive fisheries, serves as an important feeding ground for marine life, and supports the socio-economic livelihoods of coastal communities. These intertidal wetlands also provide fertile ground for sequestering and storing vast amounts of atmospheric carbon. The protection, restoration and sustainable management of this delicate ecosystem is an environmental emergency and a priority for the government of Sindh. In response, we have shown leadership and demonstrated a clear vision and delivered extraordinary results. In 2015, we entered into a public-private partnership arrangement with Indus Delta Capital. Together, we have designed, planned, and are implementing the Delta Blue Carbon Initiative, the world's largest mangrove conservation and restoration project. Our vision is to protect the Indus Delta tidal wetlands from human disturbances so that they can be safely passed on to future generations. To that end, we have rehabilitated vast areas of degraded mangrove forests and are ensuring they are sustainably managed. We have effectively engaged local communities and have made them resource towards through the mechanism of mangrove stewardship agreements. Using these innovative approaches, the Delta Blue Carbon Project has already restored more than 80,000 hectares of degraded mangrove lands with highest degree of success. The government of Sindh is also implementing sectoral policies and strategies that support sustainable development and minimize deforestation and loss of ecosystem services. Delta Blue Carbon's pioneering interventions are powered by science, economics and grounded in best industry practice. The project is designed as a nature-based solution to climate, environmental and development problems and is thus premised on the concept of making use of coastal wetlands and oceans as a climate solution. It shows that restoration and conservation of mangroves and other coastal and marine ecosystems are an untapped potential for climate action, which needs to be capitalized on. It also highlights the role that the industry and private sector can and needs to play in realizing the blue carbon vision. While preparing the project documentation, a number of considerations had to be projected into the future. These were necessitated by the fact that climate change and resulting sea level rise and other impacts of climate change 
has implications for land use changes including coastal erosion, landward ingression of intertidal zone and carbon sequestration by mangroves and other coastal ecosystems as well as coastal and marine biodiversity. These and other related fields need to be carefully investigated and studied. Therefore, relevant research scientists, bodies and institutions have to play a role in identifying and closing gaps in blue carbon science. Since the success of blue carbon projects heavily depends on the continued engagement of private sector and local communities, it has to be ensured that blanket use of blue carbon credits for nationally determined contributions has to be avoided so that real potential of it as a nature-based solution is not compromised in the process. This is critical for realizing the ambitions as set forth for blue carbon as a new frontier for conservation. There is also a need for developing new and simplified methodologies so that innovative blue carbon projects can be validated and verified in a timely manner for realizing the potential of blue carbon as a climate solution. Such like success stories which exemplify and demonstrate the design and implementation of blue carbon projects at scale in partnership with private sector and industry need to be relied on for lessons learned on different aspects of blue carbon development besides being promoted and projected on world forums like these. I am confident that the project will become an iconic symbol and prototype for sustainable development in other parts of the world. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, start by thanking uh, Blue Marine and the uh, Toulouse uh, Gulbenkian Foundations for organizing uh, this exciting event and the invitation to take the floor. Uh, my task today is to talk about the future of blue carbon science. And I believe that's uh, very timely, not only because we are celebrating uh, Ocean Week uh, this week, but if we look at the next slide, please. Uh, also because uh, tomorrow the IPCC and the IPBS, which is uh, the same as IPCC, but for the uh, Convention for Biological Diversity, thereby advising uh, the UN CBD on uh, the state of science on biodiversity, are going to launch for the first time a joint report on the nexus between biodiversity and climate change. And this is very much what Blue Carbon is about. Uh, can we move to the next slide, uh, please? So, in fact, uh, uh, we're going to be discussing carbon throughout the entire day. And I believe it's wise to start with a depiction of the global carbon cycle and then realize that uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases and emissions due to cement production are a significant contribution of the, of the total uh, emissions. But in fact, there's one component uh, which is called land use change and has to do with the impacts of uh, altering ecosystems with uh, the balance of greenhouse gases that is responsible for 38% of cumulative greenhouse emissions. So that is very significant and it's about impacts to ecosystems. But the land use term is actually a misnomer because it's not just land that has been altered. The ocean has also been changed. And I'd like to uh, give you just one uh, uh, example of the power of uh, carbon in the ocean. And if we look to uh, the next slide, please, then you can see a landscape that is very familiar to uh, the landscape where uh, Blue Marine is rooted. These are the cliffs of Dover. And what you see there is actually uh, the works of marine carbon uh, 90 million years ago. This is microbiology accumulated in very thick deposits. By now, after 90 million years, the carbon is largely gone. And what we see is the carbonate that remains. But anyway, just imagine a uh, hundred meters of carbon deposits that this was once in the seafloor. That is the power of the ocean to uh, remove carbon and accumulate carbon and thereby the underpinnings of blue carbon. So if we go to the next slide, I would like to uh, also share that, uh, emphasize the fact that the uh, uh, land use change is not restricted to land, but actually happens in the ocean. And we have lost about 35% of the historical mangrove area. 
about one third of the seagrass area has been uh, lost, 16% of tidal floods, 85% of oyster reefs, two thirds of, of salt marshes have been lost, and about 40% of coral reefs have already been lost and degraded. So we're actually uh, losing ecosystems on the ocean as well, not just on land. And that has a burden on carbon because carbon is the fabric of life, is the fabric of these uh, blue carbon ecosystems. Next slide, uh, please. So in 2005, we published our first uh, assessment of the contribution of marine vegetation to the oceanic carbon cycle that was based on metabolic and sediment carbon budgets uh, and highlighted the global role of vegetated coastal habitats in carbon boreal. So in the next slide, we can see that we uh, specifically uh, found that these uh, angiosperm dominated marine habitats, which are mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows, occupy less than 0.2% of the seafloor, but are responsible for half of the organic carbon buried in marine sediments. You can see that at the very bottom where you see a blue arrow that shows that we calculated these blue carbon habitats to uh, contribute 45% of the carbon buried in the ocean. For comparison, we're going to be also discussing uh, carbon uh, burial in continental shelf sediments. This is one third of the carbon sequestration that occurs in uh, blue carbon habitats, even though the is occupy a relatively tiny strip of land around the continents. But they are very powerful carbon sinks, sequestering uh, 10 to 30 times more carbon per hectare every year than tropical forests, and holding carbon stocks that are 50 to 100 times larger than those in forests. And that's because there are no fires underwater. So this carbon that accumulates in soils, in our oceans, are safe from being burned up from uh, forest fires. So in the next slide, uh, we can see that uh, um, this uh, loss of uh, carbon in the ocean, which is actually a loss of a uh, blue natural capital, is not irreversible. And last year, we published a paper in the journal uh, Nature, a pledging uh, based on scientific evidence that rebuilding marine life is possible, and that is possible to uh, substantially reveal the abundance of uh, life in our oceans, habitats in the coastal zones, uh, populations of large marine animals, and other uh, components of ocean life that have been decimated by 2050. So within 30 years, and in rebuilding the abundance of marine life, we also restore and repair the capacity of the oceans to sequester carbon. So in fact, ocean conservation for biodiversity is intimately linked with climate action and that nexus of biodiversity and climate action are very much an essence of blue carbon strategies. So on the next slide, uh, we can uh, see that uh, tackling the problem of uh, uh, our climate uh, crisis is going to requ require that we activate all, le all levers that we have available. We need to reduce emissions by uh, increasing uh, renewables and also energy efficiency. We need to uh, reuse and recycle uh, carbon that are, uh, are being produced uh, from fossil fuel burning. We need to activate uh, technology fixes to remove carbon already in the atmosphere or at risk of being released to the atmosphere. But we also have nature-based uh, which uh, are uh, a pathway to uh, remove carbon dioxide that is already in the atmosphere and belongs to this 35% of uh, cumulative carbon em emissions of greenhouse gases due to the loss of uh, ecosystems. So on the next slide, uh, I would like to highlight that nature-based solutions, which are a pathway to uh, restore ecosystems and restore the abundance of our uh, natural capital uh, by uh, conserving, uh, restoring, and protecting ecosystems is actually a pathway to decarbonize the atmosphere and remove uh, uh, carbon dioxide that is already in the atmosphere to recarbonize the biosphere and increase the stock of living carbon that we have uh, lost, particularly in the oceans, but also on land. So restoring the abundance of life on land and oceans not only is a requirement to uh, repair our planet in terms of our biodiversity goals, but also contributes to uh, climate action as an essential component 
of climate action. So uh, mindful of the role of oceans in a, uh, in the carbon cycle, we proposed, and we can see on the next slide, the strategy called Blue Carbon, and that was a report that I published along with colleagues in different uh, UN agencies, and that's where the term Blue Carbon was coined in 2009, and that uh, report uh, proposed that uh, conserving and restoring seagrass meadows, mangrove forests, and salt marshes was a, a smart pathway to achieve our climate goals and also climate change adaptation. And by now we estimate that the contribution of these blue carbon strategies to uh, our climate action probably uh, would amount to about 3% of the emission reduction needed to be able to meet uh, our climate goals under the Paris Agreement. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, this is based on protecting and restoring these blue carbon habitats to uh, protect the carbon stocks as organic carbon in the sediments. But we are also learning of other powers that these ecosystems have. And blue carbon habitats growing on carbonate sun also activate an additional carbon dioxide sink, which is an alkalinity release. So they, these habitats uh, through the roots and respiration of the communities in the sediments then uh, dissolve uh, bedrock carbonate and this uh, dissolution of carbonate release alkalinity that displaces the uh, um, inorganic carbon system in the water column to lock, car lock carbon dioxide. And for instance, in the Red Sea, we published last year that this component that is currently not embedded in calculations of blue carbon capacity is about 23 times larger than the capacity of mangroves in the Red Sea to lock organic carbon in sediments. So uh, this is a big multiplier, if used wisely, of the capacity of these blue carbon habitats to contribute to a greenhouse removal from the atmosphere. So that 3% that I mentioned is the starting point, but the scope can be far larger. Another component in the next slide is, uh, that we can see in the next slide, is uh, seaweed. So seaweed globally, uh, about 7 million square kilometers, which is the same area as the Amazons, and the contribution to uh, primary production is similar to that of the Amazons. And they have been neglected in a blue carbon science, even though they are the largest uh, habitat of large plants or, or photosynthetic organisms in the short run. Uh, we are working at calculating uh, what might be the contribution of microalgae, but there are challenges in activating the role of a wild algal forest to contribute to climate action. So we have been focused on another component so that I highlight in the next slide, please. Which is a, a, a sequestration by algal farms. So half of the a seaweed production, a, both in wild forests, but also in a seaweed farms is actually released to the environment during growth. And we believe that a large part, part of this production is actually accumulating and stored in uh, soils below seaweed farms. And currently we have 2,000 square kilometers of seaweed farms, of which 95% are in Asia, and uh, it's expanding at 7% uh, per year. So if we look at the next slide, then uh, we see that we have now uh, created uh, in Oceans 2050. It's an organization that I uh, uh, serve as a chief scientist. We have created a global network of seaweed farms uh, with seaweed farms in all continents, 23 of them, to calculate what is the climate benefit of seaweed farming and calculate for the first time carbon sequestration below the farms. We are already working with some tentative uh, estimates. In the next slide, we can see our forecast of what might be the capacity of seaweed farming uh, moving forward to contribute to climate action. So 7% uh, has been the long-term uh, growth of seaweed farming, but there is uh, an exponential growth in demand for seaweed products for many, many purposes. Uh, it is a very sustainable uh, material that is now under demand for many industries. So we envisage an acceleration of the demand and the growth of seaweed aquaculture, probably achieving 20%. And if we achieve a growth rate of seaweed aquaculture of 20%, then we can achieve uh, 0.3 gigatons of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide removed per year by seaweed farming, which is already a very significant 
contribution. And up to now, we have been focused on uh, photosynthetic organisms, plants and seaweed, but the ocean also contains some of the giants of the world, uh, which are not uh, trees, but actually whales. So in the next slide, we can see that uh, there's also scope, uh, next slide please, there's also scope to uh, activate uh, climate action through rebuilding. Uh, please, can you go one slide back? to uh, by rebuilding the abundance of large uh, marine whales. And please remember that the fact uh, that we have only about 10 to 20% of the stock of large whales, uh, great whales left in the ocean, is not because we hunted it for food, is that, is that we hunted them for power. We actually burned them to light the, their oil, to light the streets of Europe and North America, so that uh, carbon that once was whale is now present and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere contributing to our climate uh, crisis. So uh, if we rebuild the abundance of large whales, we can uh, turn carbon dioxide that once was a beautiful whale back into being a beautiful whale. And then in the next slide, we can see that uh, rebuilding the stock of large marine whales has been calculated in a paper published by Ralph Shami and co-workers in the International Monetary Fund to potentially contribute 0.8 petagrams of carbon removal per year. So again, a very large contribution, this time not from plants or algae, but from whales. And in fact, we are seeing a major rebound of some species of whales. Uh, for instance, humpback whales have expanded from 200 uh, animals left in 1978 to more than 60,000 today. So this is actually happening and it has uh, it brings about climate benefits, but we are now starting to understand what those benefits are about. And in the next slide, we can see that it is not just about uh, whales, but in fact, large marine animals act as major pumps of carbon in the ocean, all the way from fish stocks that move carbon vertically with their migrations in the water columns, to pinnipeds and uh, whales and other animals that are important players on the global uh, uh, carbon cycle and contribute to an active pump that removes carbon from the surface and locks it into the deep sea. So by rebuilding, rebuilding the abundance of large uh, animals, we can also activate the ocean carbon cycle and then contribute to climate action. There's challenges around the governance of this solution, but it is an important solution because it also brings about key benefits in terms of biodiversity. So on the next slide, we can see one uh, last component that is going to be dis discussed today. And I believe that discussion was initiated by this paper uh, published on the uh, value of carbon flows and stores in the coastal and self ecosystems in the UK. And this is now uh, being brought to a global scale. And there's an opportunity to also manage the conservation of carbon stocks in sediments beyond uh, blue carbon habitats to then contribute to climate action as well. That's going to be discussed uh, uh, later. So on the next, and I believe final slide, then I try to summarize uh, the state of play on uh, blue carbon. So we can see the three components that can be activated to, uh, to uh, generate blue carbon projects, mangrove, uh, salt marsh and seagrass, conservation and restoration are already mature. They have already been approved by the IPCC and they're embedded in the nationally determined contributions of over 70 nations uh, that will be hopefully increased uh, in Glasgow this year. And the scale of these are about tens to hundreds of teragrams of carbon dioxide uh, removed. Uh, so a relatively modest contribution adding to, to 3%. We need to also uh, look at the contribution of these habitats and the, their uh, value in dissolving carbonate and releasing alkalinity, which can be a big multiplier of this number of 3% of the solution. We are also looking into the contribution of wild algal forest. I don't think that we will uh, be able to activate this solution because the viability is uncertain uh, because of different uh, reasons. The permanence is not guaranteed and also the traceability of finding out what this carbon ends up is also challenging. And then uh, seaweed farming is a, a already a promising solution where R&D are still ongoing, but we are ready to move in demonstration scale projects 
and the scale can reach up to petagrams of carbon dioxide. And as indicated, we have two more solutions. Somehow the table is too large, so we don't see the bottom part, but there is the uh, contribution of rebuilding the stocks of large marine animals, for which we still to uh, do a significant research to both quantify uh, this contribution and also resolve the governance, how to apportion that uh, carbon to different uh, actions and, and actors. But the scale can be also the petagram uh, carbon dioxide scale. And finally, management of carbon stocks in continental shelves, which also requires significant uh, R&D, but also has a scale of uh, hundreds of teragrams to even uh, in the order of petagram uh, carbon dioxide. So collectively, we might be looking at 15% of the greenhouse gas removal uh, required by activating all of the blue carbon strategies that I summarized. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions and address the questions that I see on the Q&A. Thank on control. The previous speaker have clearly articulated the climate benefit of the blue carbon ecosystem, but for low-income coastal community, blue carbon systems are a lifeline. In some cases, underpinning food and energy security from vast regions. As example, it is estimated that the livelihoods of over 4 million small-scale fishers are heavily dependent on mangrove. Mangrove and over blue carbon system are also the cornerstone of climate change adaptation for over 200 million people, not just in small island states and lower income country, but in many higher income country as well. Yet, for the million of people living in a poverty in tropical coastal area, cutting mangrove for aquaculture or agriculture or to produce timber or charcoal is often the only source of income available. Collapsing fisheries and a lack of alternative livelihood options means community often find themselves with little choice but to deforest mangrove to meet their basic needs. This situation is continuing the spiral of ecological and degradation of mangrove and COVID also intensified the situation. The world needs a change where the conservation and restoration of a, blue, uh, of a blue carbon ecosystem is a financially viable option, not only for the coastal community, but for broader economies and for country as well. If not a miracle solution, Blue carbon has a potential to support this change. When blue carbon ecosystems are lost, it is often that local community that have the most to lose. But if a blue carbon project place community ownership and engagement at their center, they also have the most to potentially gain from the blue carbon. Any community-led initiative that protects or restores one of the blue carbon ecosystem is a factor of blue carbon projects. If the community can measure, monitor, and report on the climate impact of its conservation or restoration, it becomes possible to access a climate mitigation finance. This is exactly what the Felicia locally managed marine area in southwest of Madagascar is doing. Together with Blue Ventures, they have created the Tairu project, which is a community-led mangrove carbon project, the first project in Madagascar, and the largest community-led mangrove carbon project in the world. Ten villages have come together to manage 1,300 hectares of intact and degraded mangrove. They work together to define and understand the underlying driver of mangrove loss and come up with solutions to tackle it. Together, they zone the mangrove into uh, three different zones, strict conservation, sustainable management, and restoration 
In 2019, his project was approved by Plant Vivo Carbon Standard, enabling the Village Association to sell the carbon offsets. 50% of the revenue from offset sales goes to the partner villages to support the construction of vital social infrastructure and also healthcare and education. 27% of the funds go to the government authority who are responsible for the projects. And the remaining 23% goes to the village association who are responsible for managing the marine area where the project is located. This finance not only supports mangrove management, but it also helps to fund fisheries management activity, which help to safeguard the fisheries that almost families in the region are depending on for income and for food security. Carbon storage is less tangible benefits for the community perspective. Mangroves do not exist in isolation. If coastal communities are to be resilient in face of climate emergency, integrated marine management is essential. It needs to support forests and fisheries management so that integrated marine management is a viable option for coastal community. And blue carbon can mean more than simply finance. If done properly, it also supports empowering and strengthening grassroots management of marine resources. Like most marine, marine ecosystems, blue carbon ecosystems are traditionally common pool resources, meaning that any project or initiative that restricts or changes access as it is inherent, the case with the blue carbon project affects not a single landowner, but rather than the entire community. So, it is really important that the community are not simply consulted, but empowered to take a lead on the project activities. And villages and community need to sit down together, to decide together, and to find solutions to together to managing their resources. This encourages cooperation within and between community, which enables effective management at scale. Lastly, blue carbon is also important in a discussion around gender equality. Women don't need a boat or expensive equipment that they may not have access to fish in a mangrove. And if a mangrove are near their village, which they often are, they can go and fish without taking too much time away from caring for their families, which is culturally remain important part of women's life across the tropics. As a woman from coastal village in Madagascar, I have one closing message. It is imperative that the negotiation at the COP26 in Glasgow in November Keep coastal community in mind for the climate finance have a maximum impact not only on ecological but also on the social. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Well, hello everyone and what a perfect transition from um, Lalao, because I will um, speak to you in the next 10 minutes a little bit about the policy context and primarily about the UNFCCC and some of the activities happening there. Next slide, please. So for those maybe not so familiar with the um, background where blue carbon came from and sort of a bit uh, the history, I just wanted to remind everyone that sort of the, the key ingredient for our actions were already enshrined in the 1992 um, Paris, I'm sorry, UNFCCC um, agreement, uh, but it was only in 2009 when it really got some traction on the international level, when there was increased um, compilation of scientific findings, but also broader um, conservation stakeholders coming uh, to, to the forefront on this topic. 
and obviously we were looking a lot to, to the big brother um, red in terms of the, the forestry related carbon discussions. A milestone then came in 2013 when um, the IPCC wetland supplement came out. And this is um, to, to highlight again that primarily and also this presentation focuses on the, the coastal ecosystem, blue carbon ecosystem, mangrove, seagrass, salt marshes. And also want to reiterate um, two points. I think often blue carbon is directly associated with projects or offsets, but it's, I think, important to reiterate that blue carbon also can play a role on the national level and vis-a-vis -vis national greenhouse gas accounting. So for example, this IPCC wetland supplement are primarily there to help countries um, submit their national greenhouse gas reports. Mm -hmm. But I think I also want to, to emphasize um, what, what Carlos and, and what was previously said, nature-based solutions play a very important role in this climate mitigation discussion. However, they are not a substitute by all means for taking um, increased action in other areas like renewable energy, energy efficiency, transportation to get us away from fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, sorry. But we all know that if we invest in these nature-based solutions in the coastal and marine space, there is a win-win, um, ideally, as La Lao underscored, for the coastal community as well around many um, ecosystem services they provide. Um, back to my timeline. So 2016, we had uh, after the, the Paris Agreement and the um, NDCs increasingly um, the recognition of blue carbon in these nationally determined contributions. And I will come back to those in a minute. Next slide, please. So we are now 2021 and uh, basically the bottom line is we have action all on fronts. We see uh, a lot of science uh, happening, a lot of broader um, national carbon stock assessments like um, here in Costa Rica. We know there's efforts in, in Kenya and around the world to really uh, bring more uh, yeah, proof from the ground um, to, to the forefront, which informs then policy making. Um, there are the various uh, sort of coalitions and initiatives that were mentioned before, like the Blue Carbon Initiative. But we also saw an increase of government interest. And there's the International Partnership for Blue Carbon that is run um, by Australia and uh, governed at the moment by UNESCO IOC. So if you have interest in joining those, you know, kindly reach, reach out to, to myself or, or Conservation International and IOC. We're happy to, to connect. Um, so we see, as I said, there's a lot of science happening informing the policy, but work that we did in the past also included uh, policy recommendation and assessments to find out where does blue carbon fit in the national context, because even if it doesn't say blue carbon at the cover, there can still be, and in many cases is blue carbon in there, whether that is around marine spatial planning, about um, marine protected areas development, broader mangrove restoration strategies, et cetera. So again, blue carbon can have on the policy context, many, uh, many forms. Um, back to the international stage um, in terms of NDCs, as I mentioned, they're extremely important because they set the stage for how countries want to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And again, through a coalition of actors, um, there was a recommendation of what it means or how um, blue carbon, both in terms of, of quantitative um, numbers, but also vis-a-vis -vis adaptation actions, how countries might consider that in, in their NDCs. And most recently actually launched uh, last week, we also looked again with a group of, of experts at the global stock take and what that means for, uh, for nature-based solutions and uh, as well as blue carbon. And I'll come to the next slide, please explaining that um, a little bit, because some of you might have come across this um, so-called ambitious cy ambition cycle, which basically means that every five years, countries uh, have to submit their revised NDC where they should take uh, more ambition vis-a-vis -vis, um, their mitigation action. And the global stock take, which you see at the bottom, is taking stock every five years of how far we've come. And it is highly important, both the science, but also for this information through NDCs and other means finds its way into this global stock take. Please have a look if you're interested at this, um, at this more specific uh, recommendations, because 
even if it's in 2023, the process is starting now and we want to make sure that the proper blue carbon, but also ocean information is in those. Next slide. Um, so on the, the NDC front, I just wanted to take a quick look back. Um, the first round of information was submitted around the 2015-2016 timeline. And there um, we there were various reports that came out, but uh, of one of them, we estimated uh, or quantified that 28 countries made specific reference to coastal wetlands and mitigation, and 59 countries more broadly um, to adaptation. Um, as many of you are probably aware, we are um, in, the, in the sort of next cycle. Some NDCs are already out, some are still to come until uh, up to Glasgow. So um, stay tuned, there will be an, an update on these numbers where we can actually see how much or how um, blue carbon and broader the coastal ecosystem management is included in those um, new round of NDCs. Next slide, please. Here's, for example, um, Chile, whose NDC is already out. And I just picked an example, um, which is more broadly on oceans and MPAs. But I think it, it's really encouraging to see that this information now finds its way into, um, into these NDCs. And then again, also linking it to other international agreements, because also UNFCCC is and should not act in its silos. And I think we, we all understand these linkages, not just SDG, but also with the Biodiversity Convention and having this underscored is highly encouraging. Next slide, please. Here is now a more specific blue carbon example from the recent Kenya NDCs, um, where you see here highlighted that they specifically proposed to conduct blue carbon readiness assessment, or also broadly integrate nature-based solution and national mangrove management plans. So again, very encouraging to see, and I'm really looking forward to by once this um, submission cycle is done, um, where we stand on blue carbon in general, and again, feeding that into the global stock take. Next slide, please. So I just wanna end up uh, with this topic, and I know there will be other presentation on it, but um, as I said before, it's extremely important for countries um, to, you know, to, to submit their NDC, but also for us um, externals, the reading of these NDCs because they set the priorities of the country. And it's highly, highly linked to finance. And this is a recent report that came out by, by UNEP, which also shows that the, the investment needs for nature-based uh, solutions are still quite large. And I think therefore um, we should and, and maintain sort of the, the pressure and the support for countries to make sure that the coastal ecosystems are in the are high in the national um, prior, priorities, because we know, as many said before, it's not just the carbon, but it's also a lot of other ecosystem services and benefits um, that uh, yeah that are worth and need to be invested in. Next slide, please. Because I think here again, this is also um, it's a signal. What's what's written in an NDC gives also the private sector a signal on where they can go, should go. And I think it's important uh, to bring out some of these projects um, that can then also make the bridge to, to investment from the private sector. And I think this links them back to, to what Lalao said as well. Um, it's the engagement of the local community so we can help move forward uh, and show these case studies, these blueprints, how they work. So both they can, on one hand, inform policy, make policy better with actual um, success stories from the ground, but also uh, bring new channels of how we finance some of these solutions on the ground. So with this, thank you very much. Hello everyone, I am Enric Sala, National Geographic Explorer in Residence and founder of the Pristine Seas project, a project that works with local communities and governments to create marine protected areas around the world. And I want to thank Blue Marine and my friends at CBC Capital Partners for organizing this conference. So carbon as opportunity for conservation, marine conservation. A couple of years ago, I put, three years ago actually, I put together a team of economists and scientists to come up with a new framework to identify which places in the ocean 
we should protect to preserve marine biodiversity, to help produce more food, but also to help mitigate climate change. And of course, we all knew that the coastal blue carbon, which is going to be mentioned extensively during this conference, uh, mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass beds, are a very important sink for carbon on the coastal area. Hectare by hectare, as you probably know, they absorb more carbon than even tropical forests. But when we looked at the rest of marine ecosystems, we realized that there was almost no data on the sequestration rates for most marine ecosystems in the way we have for mangroves, for example. So we couldn't figure out what would be the additional carbon sequestration if we protected marine ecosystems around the ocean. Instead, we decided to look at what are the largest carbon storehouses in the ocean and how marine conservation can help secure those stocks. And the first thing we, do, we did was to look at the seafloor, the largest feature on our planet and the largest carbon storehouse. But when we started three years ago, there was no good map of the global carbon stocks in the ocean. So with our team led by Trisha Adwood, we decided to produce that map. And we found that the top meter of the sediment on the seafloor contains twice more carbon than all the soils of the land. That's a great news. It's more than we expected. The ocean absorbs, stores more carbon forever than, than we expected. But the problem is that we disturb a lot of that sediment and the carbon in it. So our question was, how much carbon is released in the shape, in the form of CO2 carbon dioxide by the activities that disturb the seafloor? In this case, we're talking about trolling bottom trolling and dredging. In the future, eventually, uh, deep sea mining. But right now, it's bottom trolling that produces the largest disturbance of the carbon on the seafloor. So using this global map and data from Global Fishing Watch, satellite data, looking at the tracks of individual bottom trawlers, we were able to estimate how much, what is the footprint of bottom trolling every year, what is the amount, the volume of sediment and organic carbon that is actually suspended in the water and how much of that carbon is remineralized to carbon dioxide. And what we found shocked us. We didn't expect it to be so big. What we found was that on average, CO2 emissions caused by the plowing of the seafloor by bottom trawlers is about one gigaton every year. This is larger than the emissions of aviation globally, larger than the emissions of shipping, larger than Germany's emissions, larger than the emissions of most countries. And if all the ocean was virgin and it was plowed for the first time, the emissions would be much, much higher. If all of the ocean floor that is trolled today has been trolled for at least nine years, we would have about 60% of that virgin carbon that is remineralized to CO2. So on average, we're talking about the, about the gigaton. This is a bucket of emissions that is too big to ignore. This dwarfs the carbon contribution from um, coastal ecosystems. And this is something that we have to pay attention to. For some countries, this represents a newly found source of carbon emissions that is a significant percentage of their land-based emissions. These emissions, uh, we're talking about maybe 2% of, of, the, of the global emission. This is very significant. So the next step in our research is, you know, we're working with uh, companies to ver um, develop and verify this methodology so it can be used for conservation projects. And we can see a future, hopefully not too far, where reducing bottom trolling effort in protecting carbon rich areas is not only going to reduce a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions, but also is going to help finance these local conservation projects. I hope that the discussions uh, go very well. Unfortunately, I cannot be right now in person. It's very early in the morning in Washington, DC, so I pre-recorded this, this message, but I hope to be present for the discussions uh, in your afternoon. Thank you very much.
Well, hello, everybody. Uh, what a fantastic series of presentations. We're now in uh, an interactive discussion, and I'd like to welcome the previous speakers back to take part in that interactive panel discussion. We've had loads of good questions already sent in, uh, some of which I've seen uh, other speakers answer directly, which is marvelous. Um, my name is James Cameron. Uh, Charles introduced me as a, as a veteran. I'm quite happy to wear that badge. I think I should have medals for past campaigns. Um, and that largely stems from over 30 years working on the climate change issue, partly as a negotiator with uh, building the coalition that became AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States, which gives me a particular perspective on, on this question, partly advising presidencies. And when, when my team advised Fiji, we made a particular uh, uh, priority for, for oceans, but also in building enterprises, including a finance enterprise called Climate Change Capital, that was trying to invest uh, around a price for carbon in order to try and achieve the objectives that we, we're, we're trying to deal with today. And so, yes, I've got a bit of experience from the past, uh, and that's actually one of the key questions I wanted to put uh, to our speakers which I can roughly cluster in these, in these ways. You know, we have had considerable experience of valuing carbon, pricing carbon in terrestrial systems, and it hasn't always been successful. There's lots to learn from failure as well. And so I want to ask a set of questions of you all, and you can pick and choose which bits of it you'd like to address from your own expertise, is what have we learned uh, from the past? and from the terrestrial example of pricing carbon. Um, we really have to get it right this time because we're up against a, a really pressing time dimension. We can't really afford further failure to do this right. So that's a first of cluster of questions to you all from your own perspective. What are the lessons learned? What should we not do this time? Uh, how can we make this response different from the past so we don't make the same mistakes? The second set of questions is really all about a conflict which is inevitable, can't be looked away from, but needs to be wrestled with, between, if you like, integrity and scale. How do we get things right in the right place so the right kind of money flows to the right sorts of projects, but we don't finish up with a lot of perfect projects and we have no scale and we can't make a difference to the, the global response to climate change that these natural systems in the oceans offer the great promise, as you have all spoken so clearly about, the great promise uh, that blue carbon offers. That's a real tension, accuracy, maybe sometimes versus simplicity. Don't look away from the complexity, but we, if, it, if it isn't simple for an investor to understand, it won't scale. These are, these are very real tensions, and I'd be interested to know where you sit in, that, in, in, you know, in the context of that tension. And the third subcluster, which again, I invite you to respond to in your own way, is, and, and Carlos has in part addressed this in his, one of his slides, what's ready, do you think, for investment? What's ready now that we could trust we could move forward so we can get some experience of doing this? Um, Carlos, I think, suggested mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass. The methodologies might be ready, the market might be ready to absorb. You've got direct examples, lalau has got a direct example. What, what, what are we ready for? And then, he uh, can't be on, Enric, but we might just store in our mind this very interesting notion of what might be coming next. And Charles has addressed this in the UK with dredging and dogger bank and the problems we face uh, with, with bottom trawling there. And I will return to the end, at the end to COP26. I'm involved with that process and I'll be curious to know what we should be doing precisely between now and Glasgow. But let's, let's begin with those three clusters of questions. You choose how you want to, to enter from your point of view. Uh, and maybe I'll just mess around a little bit with the order and ask Lalau to go, to go first, if that's OK, Lalau. OK, uh, that is uh, really OK. Um, I will pick up uh, the first question. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, uh, for the success of the blue carbon uh, project, uh, it is uh, really important to involve the community 
and uh, because the community plays an important role for the success of this project, without community engagement and community empowerment, uh, the project will not be uh, successful. And uh, that side, that community needs uh, to have um, a good local governance, mainly they should have um, secured uh, rights to manage a portion of the, of the blue carbon ecosystem. Because we vote uh, secured uh, tenure uh, rights for the community, uh, they cannot play a role uh, for the success of this project. So for me, um, the important key and the key foundation for the Blue Carbon project is uh, the good local governance and the um, secured tenure right for the community. That's, that's good. good, nice. Very good and clear and uh, tells you how you should get these projects done effectively and, and reduce the risk that they fall over in, in the future. Um, uh, Dorothy, do you want to, 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 to weigh in on your, uh, on your perspective on, on this? Uh, any one of the three, but cho choose where you want oh, to come in. Maybe a combination. A yeah, good, right. <laughs> good, good question uh, asked. Um, I think, yeah, the, the integrity and, and scale, I think there, there is a bottom line of standards and, and accounting that we should not let go. I mean, we know that and I'm sure Jen Howard and others can you know, give you much more hands-on experience. It can be costly, it can be time consuming, but we, if we are serious and real about real carbon emission reductions, there needs to be a certain rigor that we are really, you know, that to, the, to the extent possible, able to, to account for that carbon. But I think it's also, um, you know, the, the package deal again, because you, you know, what is viable, what is investable, et cetera. Um, at least uh, the route that we've taken with uh, the BNCFF is to look at projects from a broader blue natural capital point of view, and I'm sure Torsten will speak about that a little bit later as well, is that yes, certain efforts or elements can be financed by our, um, the carbon market, but um, for an complex projects, often mangrove restoration that includes community, you know, where communities should benefit from, et cetera. It, it has a certain price tag, but I believe um, because of all its benefits, we see that people are willing to pay for it or pay a premium, et cetera. So I think also in, in the implementation, and you asked about what to learn from, from red or forestry, I think is this, this package deal. It's the way how we manage mangrove, not just for carbon, but how do we manage them for sort of the, the entirety of their ecosystem service that they still produce, um, you know, livelihoods for, for local communities um, and so forth. Maybe um, on also what's, what's real, what's possible. And I saw in the chat here in the meantime, a question also about the bottom trawling, et cetera. I think in, in the bigger scheme of things, again, we, we need to, we, we are sort of, with the big heart, we are ocean conservationists, but we also want to do something for climate. And I think for the ocean, we have many reasons um, to invest in these projects, but I think on the bigger scale of climate, and when we look at a lot of the, the topics that come up of bottom trawling or uh, yeah, the, the sort of accounting of whale carbon, et cetera, I think we need to always balance a little bit, you know, how much more do we need to know? How much more do we need to invest into finding out the right solutions, setting up the right mechanisms versus investing in those solutions that, that we know work and that we have. And it's a trade-off and it's a difficult discussions to have. So I think it, it's also important and, and related to the UNFCCC process. And I think that's why I showed this initial slide. These processes are extremely slow and take a lot of time. And we were lucky in that sense um, that the, the IPCC wetlands guidance were already mandated by the COP to the IPCC. So we said, well, it's wetlands, doesn't that include coastal wetlands? And we're able to sort of, without a new mandate, able with the right expert to, to bring that information in. And in that sense, the definitions of the UNFCCC stop at that coastline. There is no other definition. There is no Excel sheet where countries submit their national greenhouse gas inventories that says any other sort of ecosystem or, or management action thereof. So that all needs to go through a process of agreement of 
requesting science technological advice. So it's nothing that happens overnight and, and really, you know, and I think that is for us sometimes as ocean people to sort of take a step back and say, where in the scale of the climate action, where does it fit? Where do we need to invest in versus what is obviously the many benefits of having more whales and the benefits of having sustainable fisheries, but from a different angle. I think that's the sort of discussion we need to have. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I'll, I'll come to Carlos in a moment, but it, there's so many interesting things to unpack there. I mean, clearly it helps sometimes to make a bridge between a conservation issue and climate. And sometimes the climate issue makes it very difficult for you to stay focused on the conservation issue because it's so big and unwieldy and this tension is very real as it happens having spent many years working on marine conservation and whales and dolphins doing all those international whaling commission events and CITES and the like i i'm actually delighted by the prospect carlos referred to this that ocean mammals can help remind us of our connection to them uh, you know, I, I think psychologically that's very attractive, but but I take your point very well that one has to really zoom in on what is possible uh, to do right now that deals with the climate change issue, and sometimes you'll re-rank your priorities uh, according according to that, and work will need to be done and will take time. Um, let me go to Carlos now, but I might want to come back to you, Dorothy, particularly on on how we accelerate. Uh, the flow of finance, taking advantage of this year where we finally are paying proper attention to natural capital and the valuing of nature. So I might just come back around to that when we talk about making taking advantage of this particular year. But Carlos, you've had some great questions, some great scientific questions that you've been starting to answer. Um, a particular one that's come through from The Guardian too about where you, how you arrive by your uh, 3% figure of, of uh, contribution from seagrass and salt marshes and mangroves. But over to you to respond to those technical questions, but also the ones that I set you. Uh, thank you, James. In fact, I've been uh, trying to address questions through the chat, including that one. Uh, but I will uh, first respond to your uh, broad overarching question. And I believe that uh, what we need to uh, activate to be able to deliver on the potential of blue carbon is first verification and second scale. So the projects need to be verified. And uh, I, I refer to financial resources that have been a bottleneck. In my opinion, that now has changed and is not because of the willingness of governments, but because of the willingness of the private sector to participate. And we've seen a uh, major pledges for carbon neutrality by very large corporations. Many of them do not have options within their operations to uh, reduce emissions. So they are seeking actively for uh, carbon crates, uh, typically from conservation and nature-based solutions. So we're seeing an avalanche of demands for carbon crates from nature-based solutions to the extent that that is becoming a risk because I am seeing some actors uh, uh, trying to cut corners to try to uh, attract some of that funding. So I think we need to be rigorous and verification is key. And a real, uh, uh, you mentioned also honesty, but actually that honesty needs to be exercised in an organized uh, way. So it's very, very important that we uh, uh, go through a verification process so that uh, there is no uh, reputational impact on blue carbon projects that might come about if some of these projects are, in my opinion, still in a smoke eventually uh, disappoint investors. Uh, scale is very important because uh, the scale of the projects that are offered is typically very small. And in fact, uh, the announcement of the project today that is the largest mangrove uh, restoration blue carbon project in the world in Bangladesh, in my opinion, is very important because it's a rising scale. But please do consider that we how to do this for a long time. And the yeah. largest uh, ecosystem restoration project yet conducted by humans was the restoration of the uh, Mekong Delta mangrove forest, Mekong War in Vietnam, where uh, nearly 2,000 square kilometers of mangrove were restored by the Vietnamese people using very simple means. And it has been calculated that the climate benefits of that restoration 
is actually many years of uh, Vietnam uh, national emissions. So this is demonstrated, it's not new. And this project happened in the 1980s to 1990. So we can restore ecosystems at scale, but the problem is that we need a clearing house that uh, matches uh, offerings from projects on the ground with investment opportunities. And also they are externally and independently uh, verified. That is really important. And I concur with Dorothy that uh, we need to uh, also find a pathway to accelerate projects because we learn and I'm back, uh, now uh, addressing your second question, uh, James, we learned that it typically takes, takes a decade from the opportunity being identified to the, uh, the point of that opportunity being market ready. And we don't have 10 more 10 years to develop these options. We need to accelerate those. We need to accelerate the R&D without cutting corners. But I believe we can do that by uh, working together and collaborating and I think we need to engage uh, policy makers and regulators from the onset, because some of those uh, activating some of those options, like the benefits of rebuilding the stocks of large whales and others, will uh, require significant creative thinking, but regulators have to apportion the benefits to different nations. Got it. Got it. We might come back to, if we've got time, to a couple of those nuances in due course, and maybe even I'll ask all of you uh, to think about now, if you had to, would, would you choose to carry on the voluntary carbon market pathway where there is clearly demand and some contestable claims that need to be worked through? Um, or would you uh, argue for a regulated marketplace, a mandatory carbon price um, set by governments or set in between governments uh, once Article 6 is agreed? There may not be either or, maybe one might be a stepping stone to the other, but let me let me leave that with you and get a question to, to Dorothy about um, the UK that's come through in the Q&A. Um, it's a good question about what uh, the British government should do with their NDC and uh, how should blue carbon be built into their NDC. We heard very encouraging remarks from, from Zach earlier. He's a great enthusiast and a great advocate, but this is a whole of government issue and I wonder whether you've got something to, to offer as an answer to that question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I saw it popping up as well. Um, I think, you know, if if the, the sort of the, the top level would be to add quantitative numbers and, and targets into uh, the mitigation section, I think that is sort of what one would hope and expect from uh, the developed countries overall, that they have the, the, the science and the backup information to actually go into some of these quanti, uh, quantified targets. And then also um, outline a little bit the programs of how those will be implemented and potentially the, the sort of improvement over time. I think with, with the bottom trolling, my personal opinion, I would be a bit careful um, I might sort of put in in a sentence or two that this is worth exploring, but I certainly would not put anything quantifiable in, in my targets just yet that I would be held uh, accountable for so that I would be a bit careful. And then I think um, on the on the adaptation side, I think also um, there's a, a lot of opportunities there to highlight some restoration. We saw Chile, for example, around MPAs. Yep. Um, you know, we, we heard uh, the UK is in the 30 by 30 target and really highlighting these synergies between SDG and CBD. I think, you know, yes, there might be different departments, there might be different, you know, uh, people talking at these conferences uh, with the UK head on, but ultimately it's, it's one UK. So I think they're um, having the leadership to show how some of the synergistic international, international alignment is possible. So that would be my so that's a great link to what I was going to ask Lanao, because um, one of the benefits of these large scale mangrove projects, and we saw it very much with the Indus Delta one in the Sindh province, is that it's a way of doing mitigation, adaptation and resilience all at the same time. And, and as you said, good for uh, a local community that needs a nursery for fisheries and all, all, there are all sorts of benefits, not all of which we currently value. But one of the attractive aspects of these substantial mangrove projects is that they could facilitate greater flow of adaptation finance as well as mitigation money from carbon pricing. 
is that how you see it now? Are you feeling that this is something you could really work into the adaptation, adaptation finance world that COP has to address? Uh, can I take that uh, question, James? Uh, yeah, uh, sure, I've asked Lalau, but um, but she thinks like she's having yeah. trouble. Yeah, so I, I would follow uh, her. Lalau, are you okay to answer that? She's just struggling, I think, with the sound. Why don't Why don't you have a go, Carlos, whilst Lalau sees if she can get uh, her sound up? Yes, uh, but in the meantime, I forgot the questions. <laughs> well, well, um, I'm, I'm trying to make the case and have it tested yeah. by that uh, one of the benefits of focusing on these uh, natural systems like mangroves for yeah. finance yes. uh, I, 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 is that you yeah. can combine. You. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. you can combine these different values so of I think I and mitigation. Yeah. Thank you. There was on a panel uh, recently where one of the panelists on blue carbon was actually coming from an, the insurance sector. And that was a very large insurance company. And uh, they uh, indicated that they had a global program looking at restoration of mangrove seagrass, salt marshes, but they had very little interest on the carbon itself. They were really interested because they calculated that if we were to restore uh, these habitats to their former abundance, the insurance sector will avoid 600 billion US dollars per year in damages to uh, coastal properties, lives, and so on. So the adaptation value of these ecosystems, which are our first line of defense, is probably greater than their carbon value. And that needs to be included in the value of blue carbon projects. Yeah, really interesting to get the, I mean, I know they are interested, the insurance industry, but they've been really very interested and they will be a main stakeholder but they need to, in addition to calculate the carbon benefits we need to calculate the coastal protection benefits yeah because that that's what they're interested in and have and have them valued um Dorothy, one of the things that um occurs to me and you, you you touched upon it a moment ago is the potential to make a really strong bridge between the two cops this year um and and this theme seems to be ideal you know to be able to bridge biodiversity COP in China, notably, um, with COP26 in Glasgow, uh, where perhaps we could, and this is sort of wishful thinking given years of attempts, but perhaps we could get a common conversation about how you adequately value natural systems and invest in them. And so that we don't have an unnecessary competition between the two worlds. How, how would, I mean, you're obviously in an organization that's very, committed to doing just that, but how should we do this best? What's the right way to go about making that bridge? Yeah, honestly, I think on, on the, the project level, the, the bridge is already there. It, it's happening. I think it's more yeah. on, on the international front where sort of some of this alignment um, might, might be needed. And I think still for um, you know, the main value for the UNFCCC remains CO2. So I think there um, that you know is is uncontested in that way, but I think what what is important um, also and, and this is a very technical topic, but what we're trying to do for the coastal side is look at indicators and how countries report on their um, successes vis-a-vis -vis the the targets, and there for one hand we have the global stock take which will play an important role in the UNFCCC, and we have currently the negotiations for the post 2020 framework. And I think if we can also help on the country level to provide sort of a more unified, would be too much to ask probably, but some sort of alignment of indicators that countries use to report on, because yes, CO2 is the main currency in the UNFCCC, but also there's a necessity to report against adaptation successes. Yeah. And I think there could be very much alignment between what the, the, um, the CBD is using. And then, of course, we also have the SDG 14 indicators and targets. And I think there's a lot of um, interest right now. I know the coral people have been looking at that again from uh, with the mangrove colleagues. We are working on something and we, we see that sort of coming to coming together um, um, more and more. But I believe on, on the project level, um, I think to some degree, 
again with with the bncff we, we try to take a programmatic approach where we work out with the project developers based on their capacity what um you know what, what do they have what can they measure where can we help improve those measurements and then make sure or to the to the extent possible that those align uh, with the the national indicators or international indicators and targets because then it's easier for this all to be aggregated and reported again um, one of the questions that's come through is is really about the cost of doing these projects and 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 sometimes the time lag between your know, initial expenditure and and return is obviously uh, painful now i don't know whether lalao are you able to can you hear me lalao yes I can oh hear good you. oh great I'm sorry no it's great it's <laughs> lovely to have you back. Yeah. welcome um look feel yeah. free to answer because you couldn't come in before feel free to answer whatever you like but at the moment i just was interested in the the, the practical difficulty of getting these projects off the ground, including the costs associated with the certification and, and the, the, the verification over time, and sometimes the gap in time between the initial investment and the return. Oh, um, oh good, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I think uh, it is uh, important uh, from, Oh, you can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, okay. The, uh, the, the question was uh, about the about the cost, and uh, from the lesson learned uh, from the ground, uh, it is uh, important to involve the communities on the project activities, uh, including the mangrove replanting activities and uh, the carbon stock monitoring, uh, because uh, this activity need to be uh, reported at an annual basis. And uh, that is that uh, community involvement can reduce, reduce the cost of the project activities. Uh, for instance, uh, when we are um, uh, the community in the project area conducted and undertaken the uh, mangrove replanting activities, at a basis, they do the mangrove uh, uh, forest patrol at voluntary also, and um, as well as the, um, uh, the carbon stock assessment at annual basis, and thus can reduce the cost to, uh, to engage like um, high level um, techn senior technician to undertake, undertake that activities. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. happy to, to yeah, go ahead, go ahead. On. Yeah, I, I think again, here comes the, the topic of sort of the bigger picture than, than carbon. I think if a project is structured around uh, different revenue uh, sources and cash flows, I think some of that, you know, to be um, returned in the future carbon uh, value can actually compensate it a little bit. If you have an, a project that is a bit more, you know, diversely constructed with maybe around tourism um, revenues or or some sort of yeah marine resources use and, and sustainable agriculture for example so i think that's certainly an, an an opportunity and a way to go and where we see some uh slowly some successes um emerging so i think it's important you know to 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 think about that and as well there's sort of different investors out there there's some that are willing yeah. to take the risk and really yeah. put up front the money and say, okay, we want X amount of uh, credits um, in 20, 30 years. And if in the end they are not there, then you know they might still have a very good conservation project, but they have, don't have the credit. So I think it depends also a little bit of which type of investor um, you, you're engaging with. And I think in, in a topic that we see increased interest is um, linking NBS with infrastructure or green gray, where again, you have a bit more the traditional route into project finance, but where also from an investor's point of view, there is really the, the opportunity to take some risk and in the project design, integrate nature-based solutions um, in there. Yeah. And I think that is really an area that we see has a lot of um, opportunity. Yeah, and you can do that with bond issuances, with fixed income products with, that have uh, terms and conditions attached to it or differential coupons uh, that reward the work done. And maybe, I mean, I've 
just had a note that we we need to bring this to a conclusion. Um, maybe maybe that's a good way actually to bring it to a conclusion is that we ought to be focusing more on rewarding the work done to deliver public goods. Now, that's really the essence of, of carbon and these various incentives. We, we, we want to reward the work done by all of you in your various ways, whether you're on the ground projects in, uh, you know, uh, in Mozambique or, or, or whether you're trying to structure projects. We want to reward the effort, the, the sometimes shared and communal effort to deliver a public good. And yes, we understand that at some point, if you want to trade something, it's got to be in a form, probably contractual, um, that makes it easy for the buyer and the seller to, to contract. But we probably don't want to over commoditize, otherwise we're going to lose a sense of this, of this public goods purpose. That the markets are only there to, 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 to deliver the public good. They're not there for the benefit of the traders. And, and that's the tension that I have experienced in the past between integrity and scale and the, the, the desire of various market participants to find something uh, that is relatively easy to, to transact on. But what we also learned from all of you is the tremendous range and variety of possibilities. And they're really significant to the problem of climate change as well as these other conservation benefits. It's not a small space for investors to look at. It's really very, very substantial. And there's enough diversity in it so that the investor isn't locked in to one particular strategy. And that's one of the things I like about this conversation and others I'm involved with is that if you were to assemble a range of natural capital investments in the oceans, you would get variety. And it'd be a nice complement also to the terrestrial investments if you were really dedicated to investing uh, in natural capital. There's enough variety there, enough diversity to be attractive to an investor that is dedicated and wants to spread risk. So as I hit, as I hit our, our time right on, I think I should just thank you all hugely for your contributions and joining in this conversation and expect it to continue with the encouragement and direction of the Blue Marine Foundation. So over to you, Charles. Thank you so well, much. May, sorry, may, may I make one last, oh, last comment? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Don't I think probably we, we, not. Talk, <laughs> we, we talk a lot about investors and projects and offset. But this doesn't mean that we need to let the governments off the hook no, to true. further put money into this coastal yeah. ecosystem that has nothing to do with markets. That's not quite true. right. Thank, That's you. Right. And, and thank you, panelists. I mean, and thank you, of course, James. I mean, panelists, you have been extraordinarily helpful. But can you answer the questions in the chat that have been directed at you uh, when you get a moment? And, and thank you all very much indeed. A huge amount of food for thought. We'll get opportunities to ask some of these questions again later. Um, now we have a coffee break, and I'm sure that uh, human frailty means we need it. Uh, so see you at 11.50. Thank you all very much. Right. My watch says it's 11.50. So uh, we're back on. So welcome back. Um, the next session is about, one, the opportunities that blue carbon could create for marine conservation and restoration. Two, the challenges faced by blue carbon projects all over the world. And three, how these challenges could be solved. Over to you. Hello, my name is James Cairo. I'm from Blue Carbon Unit of the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. Today, I'm going to talk about sustaining community momentum in blue carbon projects. I know most of you are interested in establishing blue carbon projects, but my question has always been, how do we keep community momentum? I'll start by sharing one of our uh, blue carbon projects in Kenya, the Mikoko Pamoja. Mikoko Pamoja simply means working together with mangroves. This is the first community-led uh, mangrove blue carbon project. The objective of Mikoko Pomoja is to restore and protect mangroves through sale of carbon credits. Mikoko Pomoja is verified by Plan Vivo standards, and we are selling 3,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year in voluntary carbon market since 2013. What, is our, what is, has been our milestone? 
We started in 2009 through consultation meeting with the Gazi community that surrounds the mangroves. In 2010, we were able to complete the project idea note and the project design document that were approved by Grand Vivo Foundation. Then moving forward, by 2010, we had already established the committee that will overall with that will run the Mikoko Pamoja as a program. In 2012, we sold, we launched Mikoko Pamoja in Gazi. And in 2013, we had our first sale of carbon credits. And then moving forward, in 2017, we won the UN Equator Prize. 2019, as normal with the forest carbon project, we had the independent verification to verify that all our activities are aligned with the PTD. Then in 2019, we thought of expanding the Mikoko activities into sea grasses and sea grasses because they neighbor mangroves and they are also carbon rich ecosystem. We opted to expand Mikoko Pamoja into sea grasses. So in 2020, our PDD was redesigned to incorporate sea grasses. If I can share you some of the scorecard, some of our achievement so far, and the link to SDGs, 70% of our income from sale of carbon credits is shared by two villages, the Gazi and Makongeni, with a resident population of about 6,000 people. We have been able to support education by providing textbooks, renovating classes, and buying and uh, supporting bursary directly for students. And this is directly responding to SDG4 for quality education. We're also providing water to 3,500 people, together with also the primary schools, the, the providing water to the health center. And this is responding directly to SDG 6. On climate benefits, every year we are selling 3,000 tons of CO2. This is the couple sequestered. And we could say that is we are responding directly to SDG 13, which is the climate action. And our project, because it's based on a critical ecosystem mangroves, which is home for fish, by restoring mangroves, we are responding to SDG 14 on life underwater. To control leakage, we are planting mangroves and we also are planting fast growing trees on land. This one is responding directly to SDG 15 on life on land. And because of our whole partnership, we have partnership with the industry, private sector, the community, academia. Our project is responding directly to SDG 17 on partnership. So we could say in simple terms that Mikoko Pamoja is a very good example of triple win project, a win for climate, a win for community, and a win for biodiversity. But we have not been without challenges. One of the challenges has been the boundary of the boundary we are talking about areas we are protecting. So there's no clear boundary, and this has led to illegal harvesting of mangrove. This can be understood because mangrove is really a dynamic ecosystem. We have the initial boundary set, but because the forest is growing, this for this boundary need to be remarked at least every two years. We have not really been uh, meeting all the technical requirement. And this is expected. As I said, this is 
maybe a uh, dynamic ecosystem. Even the meeting, simple thing like annual planting, we are supposed to be planting 4,000 mango trees per year. But where we are planting, there's a lot of erosive activity because it's near water. Poor governance and the dynamism of mango environment has been a really uh, a challenge. Capacity building is another thing. This should be a continuous process, but requires financing, requires capital. So we have not been able to train and retrain the incumbent members learning the Nkoko Pomoja and those incoming. There's also lack of income diversification. And this is, uh, if you understand, the voluntary carbon market is so volatile with carbon value getting so low. So it's so much essential that if you have to look long term, you need to diversify the income generated from your carbon sale. This has not been possible. How do we want to move forward? Our forward, our first forward is to include the seagrass in carbon financing scheme. We have done this by revising the BDD. We are also supporting the, the community adjacent mangrove to move forward with carbon, low carbon cooking stove. This is what we call the energy saving stove. The energy saved can also be incorporated in carbon sales. And another moving forward is influencing national policies on blue carbon. This year, the last year, 2020, we were able to incorporate the sea classes and mangrove into the national determined contributions and disease. And we hope by incorporating mangrove carbon in NDC, will able to, the government is able to mobilize resources and prioritize climate actions, particularly those related to blue carbon ecosystems. If you want to learn more about Nikoko Pomoja, you can visit our website. And you can also consider offsetting with us. Thank you so much for your listening. Hello, my name is Torsten Thiele, and I'm excited to talk to you about the economic possibilities of blue carbon. Now, to set the scene, we will look into green payments for blue carbon, discuss the pitfalls of a mitigation-only perspective, look into broader economic opportunities, and add blue natural capital for adaptation, resilience, livelihoods, and biodiversity, and then conclude in putting blue carbon economics into this broader context, the context of a blue new deal of coastal infrastructure finance with nature-based solutions to deliver a just transition. Now, 10 years ago, this paper came out to discuss green payments for blue carbon and it really argues very clearly that the value of the mitigation that is provided by blue carbon ecosystems is such that we could justify this mitigation effort purely from selling on these blue carbon credits. And the supply curves that I've shown here show even under higher cost scenarios that obviously always dependent on the price of certain carbon credits, the potential for cost-effective mitigation is very significant. Now what this, this curve does not do is to really look in detail at the transaction costs, the cost of measuring, monitoring, accounting and distribution, nor does it look at restoration costs and restoration effectiveness per se. But it is a critical starting point to say, if we can sell the credits that come thanks to the 
contribution of blue carbon as carbon sinks, we get to an economically effective proposition. And what is so interesting is that across all of the key blue carbon ecosystems that were looked at at the time, so obviously the, the mangroves uh, at the coast, but also in estuaries, also in salt marshes, also in sea grasses, the inclusion in particular of soil carbon means that if this carbon credit potential is properly harvested, we have a competitive proposition here, which is comparable to some degree to the proposition that we have with tropical forests. Or to put it in another way, simple blue carbon economics suggest that the majority of carbon offsets in the blue carbon ecosystems could be generated at a price of what was then US dollars of 10 per ton of CO2. And that if we, in addition, focused on the biodiversity relevant aspects of blue carbon, that additional cost is really not massive. It's a maybe a further ton. So this is from a paper of 2012. Now what we have seen since in a paper that came out this year is that the restoration costs between these different ecosystems and different local sites really can differ very significantly. But that the effectiveness of restoration beyond blue carbon, that is in terms of delivering other ecosystem surfaces, could also be very high. So what are we left with. We are left with what I would call the blue carbon finance dilemma. Purely economically speaking, the benefit of protecting natural capital far exceeds the costs involved. And this is very much the case for blue carbon ecosystems. And there is global biodiversity funding, but there remain large gaps. And the challenge we have if we look at a blue carbon project purely in a standalone way and purely compare it from a carbon offset credit price alone, we have to take into account that this project will have inherent risks, that the country or the ownership of the site creates potential risks, that the nature of the developer, their experience, their scale, etc., creates risk, and then there are risks of the process of assessment, etc., etc. So we have a range of risks which have meant that we have had much less investment into blue carbon purely based on the blue carbon mitigation impact than fundamentally is economically warranted. And so therefore, we need to think about blue carbon economics in a broader sense. We need to think about how we can scale sustainable blue carbon finance in an integrated way and that takes on board innovative pathways for investment. And these concepts around comprehensive blue carbon economics are what we are really at now in the blue carbon space where we are looking at ways of moving beyond just voluntary carbon credit trades to the creation, the structure of regulated markets and the price points that could come with that. Where we look beyond the individual project to programs, where we take a perspective that isn't just about what can the project provide as a seller of carbon credits, but what are the perspectives of potential carbon credit buyers? What are the value drivers from their perspective? And likewise, we're going beyond the blue carbon mitigation credit component to valuing the broader blue natural capital. And this entire valuation effort that is ongoing around nature, around uh, ecosystems and around blue natural capital is a journey that will help us to develop these comprehensive blue carbon economics. So we're moving from standalone to integration, to using nature-based solutions 
as part of a sustainable strategy for coasts, where we talk about a sustainable blue economy and blue infrastructure finance as ways to describe a new normal in which the blue carbon ecosystem and the economics of the blue carbon ecosystem are entirely tied to the broader outcome that we're aiming for. And uh, this picture shows how we can integrate nature-based solutions in a whole range of coastal structures and in particular infrastructure. And infrastructure is of course so important because it is one of the largest sectors of financial spending. And so if you build a new road or a waste um, management plant or wastewater treatment or new energy system, all of these you need to think how you can use the nature-based solution that is the wetlands, the mangroves, the blue carbon ecosystems as part of the delivery of the resilience of that infrastructure. Because only if you have a resilient infrastructure that adapts to climate change and that delivers additional opportunities for livelihoods, for local communities, and therefore provides a long-term attractive resilience investment opportunity, then you are at the point where the blue carbon project serves a function beyond just selling the carbon credit. And that is really where the economics of this are so important. And so we need to look into the mitigation part, where we have to be specific and scientific, but from an economic standpoint, we also look into, in, into the storm resilience, into the adaptation part to sea level rise, into the decision of where properties can benefit from the surrounding nature and biodiversity that come with that blue carbon ecosystem. And so the blue carbon economics are really at a very interesting point. We are looking at new blended finance solutions to de-risk these individual investments and to bring in broader range of investors. We use the robust metrics and monitoring of carbon stocks as well as of these additional benefits, including in particular biodiversity benefits, to create funding opportunities. We argue that blue finance requires an enabling framework, so governments based on their NDCs, on aligned implementation efforts. And we propose that blue carbon and the broader concept of blue natural capital, which also includes ocean economics, ocean accounting, is really an emerging asset class for investors to look into. And this allows the engagement of private sector partners, both as investors and as developers, local communities, NGOs and civil societies to address these various risks we've identified and deliver additional revenues in the blue carbon project and ecosystem that support resilience. And that is what we describe as the just and equitable transition because the new blue carbon deal works if it has a broad-based participation and that way it is also economically sound. So the economics of blue carbon is really a transition away from a credit valuation of three or five or ten or twenty dollars to a understanding of a functioning blue carbon coastal economy where the contribution of the blue carbon value to that entirety really would be measured in the hundreds of dollars. So thank you very much and I leave you with a list of references. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to this group today. Um, my name is Jennifer Howard. I'm the Senior Director for the Blue Carbon Program at Conservation International. Next slide. I wanted to start a little bit today with just some background on CI's Blue Carbon Program. 
and why we were asked to talk today about lessons learned from um, our years of experience. We've been doing blue carbon science policy and implementation work for about 10 to 11 years now, really working with the Blue Carbon Initiative in particular, many of the scientists and experts that have spoken already today and will continue to speak throughout the afternoon, um, and working with the International Partnership for Blue Carbon. But I'm here today to talk about um, sort of our piloting of crediting projects, in particular, our award-winning Cisplata Columbia project. Um, so next slide. So our project in Colombia is called Vida Manglar. It is the uh, first blue carbon project to use the new VCS uh, blue carbon modules that were approved last September. Um, next slide. And as many people have mentioned already today, the project's objectives are yes, climate mitigation and adaptation, but it's a much bigger issue than that. You know, we want to look at how do you improve management of mangroves uh, in the region, uh, promote sustainable development, strengthen local governments, and conserve local biodiversity. You'll see here um, one of our partners holding a needle crocodile. Uh, that's just one of the species that is a focus of our project, along with manatees and otters, as well as many migratory birds. That provides a lot of local tourism opportunities and um, livelihood options that we wanted to continue to support and explore. Next slide. So uh, go ahead and click uh, the next one to get the map thing. Uh, clipboard, there you go. So our project is in two phases. The first phase is uh, the portion that you see circled here, that is Cispata Bay. It is a mangrove conservation project right now, though restoration activities are taking place as well. Um, and so that project started around 2015. So we have a back date of our project to that time period. And we have um, submitted all of our documents. The project's been approved. We requested issuance for the first uh, tranche of credits from 2015 to 2018, um, last maybe two weeks ago. And we're in the process now of selling those credits. Uh, click forward. There'll be a second phase of this project where we will expand the area uh, to make it a grouped project into the Caimanera Lagoon in um, Guacamaya. And that will include then all of the mangroves in the entire Gulf of Morosquillo. Um, the next issuance will also include the restoration activities that are taking place in Cispata. And we'll make that request um, for credits for the time period of 2019 through 2022. Um, in, tw in 2022. Um, and this project has been very successful. The Colombian government is very excited about it and has already asked CI to participate in expanding it along the entire Caribbean coast and then potentially to the Pacific coast of Colombia. Next slide. So some key baseline information, Cispata is a pilot for us. So it's relatively small, just a little over seven and a half thousand hectares of mangrove forest in the first phase. Um, we're working with three different municipalities, over 12,000 people that use the mangroves, most of which are in a high level of poverty. Um, they're the drivers of deforestation, include agriculture, buffalo and cattle ranching encroachment, um, as well as tourism. But over the course of the project, we do think at least in the Cispata area alone, we'll be able to achieve about 1 million tons of avoided emissions over the lifetime of the project. Next slide. So um, looking at the funding of, um, situation in, in the area, you have sort of your core management needs for the project with most of that going towards implementation and monitoring. And then uh, different groups that are contributing to the funding allocations that results in a 69% gap. Please click. Uh, and we click one forward. And so we do think the blue carbon credit sales could cover over 50 to 70% of the funding gap. But of course, that's not 100% of the funding gap. So we do have other funding streams coming from tourism and uh, compensations from other companies doing business in, in Colombia that will fill the rest of that gap. Next slide. Um, when it comes to crediting finance um, and how we're working with that in Cispata, we have um, like I said, we completed our first issuance and we are actually doing something that I think is pretty innovative, which is auctioning off those credits. 
The first auction is actually happening right now. It's invite only uh, for a thousand credits, so a relatively small amount, but we have a floor price set at $15 a ton. Hopefully we will be driving those prices up through the auctioning process. A second one will be happening next week for a similar small amount. And then we'll be giving out, uh, doing a third auction for 8,000 credits with a new floor price based on the research done in the first two auctions. We're also looking at direct sales, but if the auctions are successful, we may put up another group of uh, credits under that process. Uh, next slide. And so when it comes to benefit sharing mechanisms, uh, where does that funding go? So there's a transparent third party that has set up a centralized fund and a management structure for the entire area of CISPADA. Um, all of the funds from the sale of the credits will go into that, that fund. And uh, that fund has already been agreed on how it will be spent to actually manage the mangrove according to a pre-approved management structure uh, or management plan for the area. That plan optimizes social and environmental benefits, has active community participation. And like I said, most of that funding, if not all of it, will go towards the implementation of a mangrove management plan. Next slide. So that's great. So uh, that's our project. Uh, we're really excited about it, but now what? How might we replicate Syspot and take it to scale? And as Charles mentioned, you know, how do we scale without losing quality and do it in a collaborative manner with communities and stakeholders? Next slide. So you might think this is uh, pretty standard, but it's really, really important to agree on roles and objectives. You need to be deciding ahead of time who your partners are and your priorities. Um, different institutions will have different goals. Um, you know, what are your national goals versus your international vision? Uh, local communities, government, enabling conditions, clarity regarding land tenure, for example, all of those need to be defined up front. Um, who is going to make the decisions? How are those decisions made? And how to balance best prices versus investor relationships? Um, where you might have an investor that, you know, engaged early and so they might want a discounted price, but sometimes that's hard to explain or to justify after the fact when you're trying to sell credits and you could be selling them for a higher price. And also looking at what are your indicators of success and being agreed on those. Next slide. Setting expectations. I'm going to focus on this first one here, which is sort of what are your standards for quality? What is the methodology you're going to use? For CI, we strictly adhere to the VCS plus CCB for quality. Um, but then for your project, how do you set up a quality project where you have the proper teams engaged and everyone feels like they're at the table, you know, with the correct community engagement, government engagement? You know, what does a good deal look like? Who gets to decide what a good deal for those carbon credits is? Um, those are all very important and need to be very clear and defined and written out um, up front. The rest of this is, is related to that, um, setting expectations, what are the data needs, what are your red flags, and when are you going to engage stakeholders? Sometimes governments want to be engaged from the very beginning. Other times you want to have a little bit more of a plan before you present it to the government. So really identifying all of those up front is key. Next slide. So governance structure, go ahead and click forward. So this is really important. This is the CI management team for this project. And what you really have to think about is what needs to happen to be successful? What are the skill sets that are required? Not who do you think needs to be involved, but what are the skill sets that you need? And then build your team around that. So we knew we needed a blue carbon expert. That was my role. Someone representing the Columbia team, uh, a donor relationship manager, which was very important, and a carbon project expert. Um, that knows how to shuffle projects through the VCS uh, uh, process. Next slide. But that was just the CI side. So then when you're looking at the entire project of Vita Manglar, Conservation International is there to provide some technical assistance, but we were much bigger than that. There's also the local government was involved, a research institute, of course, local community representatives, which was key, as well as local NGOs. And so that made up sort of the larger management structure for the entire project, which was key to ensuring that everybody felt again, that they were well represented, everybody knew what was going on and there was transparency in decision-making and throughout the entire process. Next slide. 
So some other things to consider uh, when doing a project like this and things that we've learned uh, from our CISBOTA project, again, define who is the project proponent, who is leading the relationship, who is the carbon owner, who oversees the science and monitoring activities, et cetera. So sort of a one name, one box situation. What are all of the tasks at hand? Who's doing what? And who is the responsible party for achieving those, those goals and making sure that's very, very clear. Establish a clear and transparent operation manual, which we did to avoid confusion and misunderstandings at the time. So that it was sort of already understood um, beforehand and agreed to beforehand. Uh, clear and transparent benefit sharing mechanism. Again, for us uh, in this particular project was a third party um, um, uh, centralized fund that was being managed uh, by the Vita Manglar uh, management team, so that larger structure, as well as um, already identifying that the funds would go directly towards the mangrove management plan that was already agreed upon beforehand, such that um, everybody knew exactly these are the priority activities that need to happen, and this is how the funding is going to be spent. So that was already arranged. Um, define effective community communication strategy between partners. Again, really, really important for transparency, wider audiences, including government representatives, the media, and et cetera. You need to be sure you're sharing your plans, your results, your experiences with all of the stakeholders. Those are the good experiences and the bad experiences in documenting these processes. So everybody understands how decisions are made and how to move things forward. We need to define a mechanism to receive questions, complaints, and claims from the local communities. That's really important as and part of uh, the social process. And then finally, develop from the beginning of the project um, implementation of a shared drive or digital system, again, for information sharing. Um, and again, this is really important such that you can have a paper trail of every decision, how it was made that anybody can have access to and see how things were done. And so if all that is set up properly and you have good transparency and good communication, I think that's obviously the key. In most cases, uh, the blue carbon, the carbon part is the least, a difficult component of some of these projects and uh, really making sure that your um, partnerships and, and, thing, and the group that you've built um, is happy with the process is, is really the most important piece to ensure longevity of your project. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm going to build on that really fantastic presentation from Jen and tell you a bit about the experience of, um, of, of developing a methodology in, in, in trying to connect blue carbon ecosystems to carbon market. And as we're thinking about going from the traditional blue carbon ecosystems, which have been established, moving more maybe into the, into the seascape. Next slide, please. So, you know, a little bit of context and uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, so people start thinking about including the biosphere and particularly forests within climate mitigation actions. And that was focused on the biomass. And around about the year 2000, give or take, um, the soils people said, hold on a second, you know, most of the world's carbon is actually in the, in the soil. And we need to start be thinking about particularly about peatland management. And so those, those sort of protocols began to develop, those sort of mitigation actions started to be planned. Around about 2010, um, the blue carbon community started to come together and say, hold on a second, there's a lot of carbon that's in the marine environment. Now, at the time, everything was focused on terrestrial systems. And so there was, a very, there was a decision made about whether we try and extend to the, include the ocean, do we have enough science? No, we didn't. So there was a focus on the, the blue carbon ecosystems, which were at the edge of the ocean, the mangroves, the marshes, and the seagrasses, for which there was a relatively um, good data set. And so it was an opportunity to take the, the, the negotiations and the, the people working on those kind of things and get their feet wet a little bit at the edge of the ocean and include some of these new good blue carbon ecosystems. So there's an opportunity to think a bit further. Next slide, please. So what do you need to connect to the carbon market? Well, first of all, you need a recognized standard. Uh, Plan Vivo, Gold Standard, uh, Verified Carbon Standard under VERA. Um, you need an accredited standard um, which can ensure the quality of the project. 
Then under that, there's a need to develop the methodology. Now the methodology really is effectively your permit requirements. <clears throat> it sets out the procedures that you need to follow and the, uh, the steps that you need to take. It really sets out the boundaries of, of, the, of the project to which the project proponent, as, as Jen was describing there, then steps forward to meet the requirements of that methodology. And there's a lot of work involved, both in terms of developing the methodologies and in terms of the project development. And the level of effort should not be underestimated. Next. And to give you a sense of timeline, um, when we worked with a very verified carbon standard um, you know, 10 years ago, and the first stage was to review the rules of the standard and modify that uh, to recognize, in this case, wetlands restoration and conservation as an eligible activity under the standard, which went along with the other activities that, uh, that they recognize, such as afforestation, reforestation, revegetation, agricultural land ma management, et cetera. So first you have to do that. Um, and then the next stage, of course, is then developing the methodologies. To which there are two main methodologies which have been developed under VERA. Uh, BM33 uh, came out in 2014, which looks at the restoration of blue carbon ecosystems, marshes, mangroves, seagrasses. And then uh, in two th 2020, um, there was an update to the red methodologies, which was focused on forests, uh, to recognize the inclusion of blue carbon soils, again, for those ecosystems. So there's a conservation methodology and a restoration methodology that out on the streets. These things are always evolving and you may see in the future that these two both come together so that there's a single methodology home for all blue carbon activities related to conservation, restoration. Next slide please. And you know one of the, interestingly one of the slow parts of the process was developing the methodology. They, you know, back then we were really fighting against the tide in terms of getting these things done. Um, investors were not interested in supporting methodology development. They wanted credits, they wanted, an invest, they wanted a return within two years, which is interesting now because now we're seeing much more patient capital in the market. People are interested in investing in, in methodology development. They're interested in investing in projects which might take a while to come online because of the wider benefits. Um, but here you see, for instance, the community that supported uh, the, the M7, you know, uh, ocean, it's mainly the ocean community that came together in the conservation community. There are the, the contributors that worked on it. So what do you need? Uh, tap one more time, please. There we go. So to recognize within your methodology, you have to address many different aspects, but uh, important parts of these are the applicability conditions. What type of activities are included and which are not? What is your project boundary? And when you think about boundaries, it's not only just a geographic setting, but it's a temporal boundary. How long will your project run? It's your greenhouse gas boundary, which gases are in, which ones you need to think about, which ones you not need to think about. You have to think about the scenarios. What is your baseline scenario? Like what is the business as usual without your intervention? And is the carbon financing actually making any difference? If it's not, you should use your money somewhere else. That is not the purpose of a carbon project. And so that leads to the additionality. Can you demonstrate that you're having a benefit because of this? Then you have to go through a whole process of quantifying the emissions reductions. And then finally monitoring. And as Jen said, maybe the science, at least for the traditional ecosystems, is relatively well advanced. It's the human aspects of this, the governance aspects, uh, which are the challenging parts, as Carol mentioned. Next. And to give an example of projects which are starting to come online, uh, Jen mentioned uh, the project in Colombia. Uh, Pakistan, which is also right now the Indus Delta Blue Carbon Project, which is going through, um, it's actually in the negotiations as, uh, uh, as we speak. Um, 220,000 hectares of mangroves are being planted with 40,000 hectares planted already. And so this is, it was, we're starting to see some sizable projects coming online. This right now is a reforestation project. There's still the opportunity for a conservation project. Next slide, please. So where are we going? Well, Vera and Silvestrum are partnering along with uh, other partners and Blue Carbon Initiative, Conservation National and others to, uh, to explore whether we can Take the, what we've learned in terms of developing um, carbon uh, connections to the carbon market to include the broader seascape. Are we, are we there yet is the question we're asking. And what we want to try and do is set out the framework where the science and the community can come together and create the mechanism, so create the methodologies so that they can plug in. Next. 
And so the goal is to unlock the potential of sustainable management, particularly the large scale, you know, what can we do in terms of sustainable development here? And how can we bring financing um, to, gen to generate uh, climate reductions, seascape? So what do we mean about the seascape and where's the potential climate reduction opportunities? Well, you will have heard um, a lot of discussion earlier on uh, from, from Carlos and, and Enrique uh, to, um, in, in the thinking here, you know, we are curious about, you know, can we connect the financing to the conservation and restoration of, of kelp beds, wild seaweeds? Uh, what about farm seaweeds, aquaculture? You know, uh, kelp as it grows sheds a lot of carbon into the environment. What about open ocean processes where carbon is not even um, taken back and used for a product other than sinking it in the deep ocean, potentially for carbon sequestration? What about seabed management, avoided trawling, which you've already heard about, can we connect there? And then another one we're interested in, which is science is very nascent, is in terms of oyster reef conservation and restoration. Is there a carbon benefit of that? And can we actually turn this into creditable activity? Now, for all of these, there are a number of questions which are gonna to have to be answered. And we're gonna to have to reach into the community of, of different levels of experience or different types of experience to answer this. You know, the science, can we quantify it? Does it lead to a sufficient benefit? Um, the safeguards, you know, at a small scale, there may be little in the way of risk, uh, but we need to think about all the various safeguards which are there. Um, introduction of inv invasive species to be avoided. Um, if we do really large kelp farming, what's the impact on nutrients? Because those nutrients are gonna go somewhere else. If we have very large kelp farms, does that impact um, the migration of species? So all of those things, and then the financial viability. And with that, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steph Simpson. I'm the Coastal Wetlands Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy's a global coastal wetland strategy team. Um, and I'll be speaking today about um, just basically uh, kind of layering on to what's already been said this morning, um, talking more about this idea of resilience credits um, as a stacked benefit to blue carbon. So I'm gonna give you a, a very quick overview of um, how we will go about to do this, our approach and the methodology for developing resilience credits, and also give some insight into what that market interest is for this as well. Next slide. So I won't go too much into the detail of background of why we know these ecosystems are so good at climate mitigation and coastal resiliency, because I think you all are very aware and a lot of that's been covered today. Um, but I do just wanna take a moment to, to again, remind us that you know, climate mitigation is but one benefit that these ecosystems provide. And so when we think about um, the other ecosystem services, we started to really think about, well, how can we also incentivize or monetize these other benefits? Um, particularly um, this benefit of adaptation or resilience. Um, we know that these systems are also really good at absorbing floodwaters and reducing wave energy um, during storm events. Um, in fact, research has shown that just 100 meters of mangroves can reduce wave height by up to 66%. So again, how can we capitalize on this benefit um, and bring more value, more um, support for, for coastal wetlands? Next slide. So when we set out to do this, um, we looked for a good framework to quantify and generate a resilience asset. Um, so we looked to Vera, um, if you can click one more. Um, we've already talked about Vera, I think a lot this morning about the verified carbon standard being um, among the standards that have approved carbon methodologies. Click next as well. Um, and so for resilience credit, we look to one of the newer programs that Vera has um, in the last few years released, and that is their SD VISTA, or Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard. And this standard um, was launched as a way to incentivize and market ecosystem and community benefits as defined by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so here we thought, well, this is great. Um, we have a program under Vera providing us with a flexible framework and Vera's high standard of transparency in asset accounting and reporting to work from. Next. And so looking at the aim of this program, we then look to the UN Sustainable Development Goals to find out where, which goal we would fit under. 
And I think if you click one more time, we'll see a highlight of SDG 13, um, which is the strength and resilience and adaptive capacity to climate related hazards and natural disasters, which to me reads exactly what we're talking about. When we talk about coastal resilience or flood reduction in coastal communities. Next slide. So um, under this program, we have uh, developed a, a draft coastal resilience methodology um, that's currently in the validation process under Vera's SD Vista program. Um, and so to tell you a little bit more about how this methodology works, um, we brought together a team, leaders in their field, including um, in the carbon market and carbon um, methodology development, since that was an important aspect of, of understanding how to write this methodology. We also want to make sure that it aligned well with how carbon offset methodologies um, are applied in coastal systems so that um, these uh, two types of methodologies for carbon offsets and resilience credits could work together um, to generate a stacked credit of blue carbon resilience credits. Um, we also work with leaders in the field um, um, in quantifying this flood reduction benefit in the coastal, uh, eco in coastal ecosystems, including Dr. Mike Beck out of UC Santa Cruz and, and colleagues. And so our aim really is to be able to combine existing carbon offset methodologies with this new coastal resilience methodology to generate third party verified blue carbon resilience credits. And then the revenue from sales of those credits can support, again, those typically underfunded project components and help um, bring, bring some more value, more support to these systems. Um, a few things that I will note though, um, is that the resilience credit could be generated separately from carbon. It is, it is a separate methodology. So um, there is an opportunity to generate only resilience credits. Um, uh, not sure uh, yet what the market looks like for only resilience credits, although I'll share a little bit of insight that we learned from a small market study in a, in a moment. Um, the methodology is still under development um, in the fact that in the way that it is under a, a validation right now by a third party. So that just means it's still subject to change. Um, and we do expect approval by the end of this year. I'm hoping before that, but um, as with this process, uh, it does, sometimes it takes longer than expected. So um, it's hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have an approved methodology to, to work from. But in the meantime, I can share a little bit more about this methodology. Next slide. I won't go over this in too much detail, um, but we do follow a very standardized engineering approach um, in how we're quantifying resilience within the coastal landscape. And we did this um, mainly because of the, the interest and support we're getting so far for this methodology is from the insurance industry. And so we wanted to use an approach that was familiar to them as the potential buyers of, of this credit. Um, and so I, I won't go through all of this, um, but it is a very stepwise approach. And, and, and though it is still subject to change as it goes through validation, I don't expect a lot of changes to these steps. Um, but one thing I also will call attention to is um, we do realize that there may be a heavy modeling burden to applying this methodology. So we wanted to give another option um, to be able to use globally available data um, where, we, where we can. Um, so we um, included a deemed estimate approach within the methodology uh, application to be able to use um, global data sets. And one example is the Menendez study, uh, 2020 um, study um, that already has quantified the flood reduction benefits of mangroves globally. So this would be an option for mangrove systems um, to be able to use that deemed estimate approach. Next slide. Um, so this, I know this is a very busy slide, but I kind of wanted to put up uh, just an example of how we we're envisioning this could work, um, where we would apply both coastal off or carbon offset methodologies and coastal resilience methodologies to generate a stacked credit, um, thereby having verified um, both of these benefits, um, which we know is something that investors are interested in. Um, but I have mentioned a lot about investors and hoping um, you know, we, we do hope that these stacked credits would go for a higher price. Um, so what does that market actually look like for resilience credits? Um, I'm gonna share a, a small study very briefly to give you some key insights that we've learned so far. Um, so next slide. Um, first, I just wanna acknowledge um, our partner in this study, was, which is EY um, Parthenon. Um, they were really great in helping us just take a glimpse at the market interest. Um, I'll reiterate, this is a very small study. Um, but uh, really, um, so I'll share some key insights here quickly in my last couple of minutes. Next slide. Um, so again, very small study. We mostly worked with um, 
uh, corporations that TNC already had existing relationships with, the more, majority of whom were already involved in making carbon neutral commitments and purchasing carbon offsets. Um, and we do hope to expand on this study in the future. And participants responded to um, a survey, but then also participated in follow up uh, focus groups and interviews. Um, and so just some key insights here, there was varying levels of interest in resilience credits stacked with blue carbon offsets. Of those that responded here, you see maybe, um, they had a lot of follow-up questions about the product typed, the price, the availability. Um, but I do wanna note that the, the higher interest of, of purchasing those offsets was, um, was, was having that measured co-benefit, um, especially you know, with, the, with the connection to SDG goals that seemed to really pique investor interest. Um, I will note that a lot of respondents saw the resilience credit as a co-benefit rather than a standalone product they would consider buying, but uh, we may see this change as more companies are expressing interest in supporting co-benefits and having those co-benefits both defined and measured and verified. Next slide. And when we asked about their willingness to pay a premium price, the answers were also quite varied, with about 10 to $20 seen as a bargain by some um, participants, um, and others willing to pay as much as $30 to $60 for a stacked offset and credit. All in all, uh, the majority of respondents indicated a willingness to pay more for a blue carbon resilience credit, um, as high as 60% more um, in, in, as far as premium prices. So while this is a small sample size for our market study, um, we're really encouraged by the respondents and plan on expanding the scope of the study to gain more insights and more effectively market these credits um, as projects are developed. Um, so I'll just close with a brief snapshot to let you know where we are working to test the feasibility of this methodology. It may be still in development, um, but we are already looking at places where we can apply both carbon offset and resilience credit methodologies. So these are just um, a few places, Texas, Belize, China, New Zealand um, are, are places where we're scoping and assessing this potential. Um, and I'll just end with a little plug that if you have um, a project in mind, um, I would be more than happy to learn more about it and discuss opportunities to collaborate. Um, and I just have my contact information there. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate this morning. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and thank you also to Blue for convening this discussion. Uh, my name is Tom Hickey. I'm a senior officer with Pew's Coastal Wetlands and NDC program, uh, a body of work I'm going to show a bit about with you this morning. Uh, so who are Pew? Uh, many of you will be familiar. We have a, a large body of marine work from species specific to, to broader habitat efforts, as well as issues such as plastics and subsidies. Uh, and within that work, we've frequently communicated the climate benefits of these efforts, and as well as conducting wider research. But uh, have never really worked principally through the lens of climate policy or instruments. There's usually a more directly relevant international or domestic policy instrument out there. The advent of the Paris Agreement, of course, changed that, specifically nationally determined contributions. They, they create a new space to recognise the benefits that, that not just oceans, but other nature-based uh, solutions can bring. Uh, P works heavily in scientific, technical and campaigning spaces, but how these efforts can collectively impact policy spheres such as NDCs is very much in our wheelhouse. So this exploration of the UN, uh, UNFCCC and NDC framework is focused on three ecosystems, seagrass, mangroves and salt marsh, uh, or collectively blue carbon coastal wetland ecosystems. Why are they such a strong candidate? Well, they provide a range of benefits to people and nature, many of which help people to adapt and foster greater resilience to the impacts of a changing climate. Uh, and of course, they store carbon, a significant amount of carbon at a rate of three to five times that terrestrial forests and often for thousands of years. Importantly, that carbon value is measurable. It's recognized by IPCC approved uh, methodologies, which means that countries can recognize these actions within their mitigation efforts if they so choose. So they are a brilliant example of the contribution that conservation efforts could make to achieving the goals of Paris. This carbon value in conjunction with these ecosystem and adaptation values is often cited as offering a, a triple benefit in addressing climate change. Uh, yet despite all of this, these three ecosystem types are still globally threatened. We've lost up to 50% of them in the last century alone. So that combination, the, the full suite of benefits, but also uh, the continued threat positions them as a very strong candidate to 
to look at the additionality of climate policy in incentivizing their protection. And we would stress additionality. There's a whole range of justifications for protecting and better managing these ecosystems, but it's the, it's the climate policy angle that this particular project is interested in. So the 2020 NDCs give us the opportunity to test the hypothesis. Countries have and are already uh, continuing to submit their NDCs. And our interest is looking at how this all fits together at that national policy level. Uh, a couple of points I'd stress, uh, some of the original NDCs, the INDCs or first iteration NDCs, reference the potential of blue carbon, but very few included specific policies and goals. So it's that translation of potential into, into action that we're focused on. Uh, and of course, there was a range of good work in this uh, broader space that predated Pew's entry. There's a, a range of research and financing programs, uh, many more, uh, looking at these ecosystem types. And the task for us is looking at how do we help potentially bring them together to inform those national level policy commitments where the whole is ideally greater than the sum of the parts. So we're looking at three NDCs by 2021, or looking to support three NDCs by 2021. And within that support, looking to assess uh, model learnings uh, for scalability. What is it that NDCs can and can't do? Where are we working? Uh, we're working with the Smithsonian Institute and WWF in Belize. We're supporting the government of Costa Rica with Conservation International and Cartier, and the government of Seychelles with Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust, the University of Oxford, and the Nature Conservancy. Now, these projects are, are quite different, actually. Costa Rica is very focused on mangroves, the inclusion of blue carbon in the inventory, and the development of, of a payment pre system service model. Seychelles are a lot more about seagrass mapping, uh, pioneering new technologies, and, and broader capacity building. Um, Belize's NDC is focused on mangrove and uh, mangrove conservation and restoration, but also looking to advance seagrass knowledge, as well as uh, recognizing coral values for their adaptation benefits. If, if I were to provide, a, I guess, an overarching description of the project goals, it's, it's trying to enable that ambition. And that's, that's partly reflective of the fact that there is a ratchet mechanism in NDCs. They are forward looking. Each NDC needs to be progressively ambitious and they are statements of intent. They can't just be retrospective accounts for what's been before. But of course, that you know that intent has to have substance. It has to have some some balance, and that's that's the balance of, of the projects. Really, is is trying to ground that will and ambition in projects that provide data, expertise, and long term capacity. Broadly, that's that's about data creation and synthesis, principally around habitat coverage and, and carbon value, but also looking to provide uh, training and workshops to to build technical, scientific, and policy capacity helping to facilitate in intergovernmental coordination. There's a range of departmental and political interests in these ecosystems and coordinating those in, is important. Looking, of course, at financing options, uh, what are the potential avenues to help implement these goals, as well as local communications and outreach with, with partners. So in Seychelles, we're working with the Institute of Seychelles Creole to identify a lexicon for the seven different species of seagrass, because there isn't currently uh, in Seychelles Creole. Broadly, this is about partnerships and capacity building. So Seychelles and Belize are due to submit their NDCs any day. In fact, by the time this is broadcast, they may be in. Um, and they have issued various political statements preceding these. So we know Belize will commit to at least doubling existing mangrove protections with a further 12,000 hectares. And Seychelles has committed to protecting at least 50% of its seagrass and mangroves by 2025 and 100% by 2030. Costa Rica's is out uh, and it's, it's brilliant. It commits to protect 100% of its wetlands, including 22,000 hectares of mangroves, the uh, restoration of priority wetland areas, as well as the development of a national restoration target, management and monitoring plans that enable sustainable livelihoods, the uh, focus on financing mechanisms, as I mentioned before, and inclusion of blue carbon in the inventory. Uh, and as of, uh, as of today, as of June, the implementation, implementation is already well underway across those pieces. Our in-country work is, is not the sole focus. We've engaged uh, with broader partnerships, so working with the likes of the Blue Carbon Initiative to develop guidelines for the inclusion of these ecosystems and NDCs, helping to convene global seagrass experts to think about the next steps necessary to advance global understanding of seagrass coverage, uh, and of course, engaging with the uh, broader ocean and climate dialogue within the UNFCCC. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, the timeline of this project was started in January 2019 and excuse me, January 2019 has benefited this coincided surge in, in, in of interest in uh, in oceans uh, solutions within the UNEP Triple C. Um, COP25 in Madrid mandated that, that, that this dialogue and, and while that's a, 
a broader institutional question of the UNEP, UNEPCCC, it does speak to this, this broader interest in aligning nature conservation with climate change. What have we learned to date? Um, firstly, to stress that ecosystem and adaptation values are key. Uh, carbon benefits are, of course, critical, and we're uh, very focused on those in this initial iteration of these projects, but these ecosystems also provide a range of benefits beyond that, that uh, emissions benefit. Capacity building is, is central to the delivery of any policy and, and no more so with long-term climate goals. And we're very focused within our projects of helping build that in-country capacity to deliver on these commitments. Um, I think it's been remarked on in, in a number of quarters that the potential of these ecosystems globally to, to, to um, abate emissions is, is potentially only 2%. And that's, that's a very reasonable observation. But it's, it's also important to look at their application in a national context. Some countries, the protection of these ecosystems can make a nationally significant contribution. Uh, the departmental interests or the breadth of department, departmental interests in these ecosystems um, is significant. We talk about ports, development, planning, fisheries, agriculture, watershed management. And the coordination of those interests is key to enabling good policy development. And of course, growing interest in other blue carbon ecosystems, uh, the potential uh, that other marine protections could provide in these carbon benefits. And one of the pieces of work that we're very much looking forward to engaging with in this area is, is working with the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum uh, on a two day symposium to coincide with COP26 uh, to look at this very question. What is it that these other protections or other ecosystems potentially bring to climate policy and looking beyond the inventory? Are there other ways of recognizing those mitigation benefits? And that's a partnership we're very keen to, to support and looking forward to engaging with. That's a very whistle-stop tour of our project. Uh, I'd of course be very happy to answer any questions if you'd like to reach out. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thanks so much, Tom, and to all the brilliant and inspiring speakers so far. I'm Claire Brooke, I'm the CEO of Blue Marine Foundation, and this next session aims to pick up on a topic raised by many previous panelists, namely how we mobilise significant capital to support restoration and protection projects in the ocean that also generate carbon credits. We started to wonder at Blue how we might help the countless small or medium scale blue carbon projects all over the world to gain access to sustained funding and the wherewithal to deliver carbon credits. Current funding mechanisms are more geared to large scale verified projects. We wondered whether we could establish a fund that would unlock significant uh, finance to develop blue carbon projects. This fund would occupy the interesting middle ground between philanthropy and investment, so-called patient capital, to aggregate and support a whole portfolio of blue carbon projects. Could we find a way of mobilizing not just hundreds of thousands through philanthropy, but tens of millions? And could we ensure that the fund ultimately delivered a return to the philanthropist investors while still protecting biodiversity, furthering science, and putting money back into local communities. As James Cameron said, how to reconcile the tension between integrity, scale and return. Having posed these questions, we realised we didn't really know the answers. So we appealed to the brilliant Finance Earth team to help us frame how this fund might look. It's still very much in draft at the moment, but we wanted to share our early thoughts, as I'm sure many of you are thinking along similar lines as we've seen this morning. Do please come to our breakout session this afternoon, where we'd love to hear from anyone who might be interested in helping to shape this sort of fund. Now over to James from Finance Earth to explain where we've got to in our thinking. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Claire. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, and as Claire has, has outlined, we, we really we, we're looking to um, understand people's views of this journey we're wanting to go on to create a blue carbon accelerator. And so my name's Jane Ransfield. I'm one of the co-founders and managing directors at Finance Earth. And, and today I'm just going to run through a few slides really outlining the journey that we're wanting to go on and really starting to show the journey 
that that could be done to to create um, a vehicle that could link up the blue carbon markets with these really impactful and really important small scale community projects. And so just as a bit of a backdrop to really understand the, the wider opportunity and, and part of what's influencing our, our thought process here is that we're seeing this enormous growth in the voluntary carbon market and this, this huge pent up demand for voluntary carbon offsets. And yet some of the most impactful and precious projects which could benefit from the growth of this market are simply too small or, or don't have the capacity or technical skill sets to be able to access the, the, the value that this market can bring. And so what we're looking to do is to really try and create a vehicle that can help join the dots between the carbon market and these really precious small scale community programs. And so after, over the last few months, we've been working with Blue, doing a global review, looking at the, a really wide range of Blue Carbon projects, really understanding what are the barriers to both creating those, but also to scaling those. And, and so we've looked at an amazing range of, of activities, everything from very large in the tens of thousands of hectares of fully restored mangrove down to the single inception scale projects that are in the tens of hectares. And it's been fascinating to really get under the skin of what are the barriers that are really preventing these projects from being created in the first place? And also how do we then start to scale and replicate those, those solutions in multiple other locations? Next slide, please. And so through this, this work, we've been, we've been amazed at the amount of fantastic organizations that are working through the blue carbon market ecosystem, working across the whole political spectrum, working to create the scientific codes, the standards, the metrics, working with community groups to actually build and implement programs on the ground, building those really fundamental partnerships, both with local communities, governments, the governance structures around that. And then also, and, and very critically, we're starting to see a range of different partners moving into the financing space and, and looking at how they can provide the type of funding and capital that, that can help support the creation and then delivery of these projects. And, and it's through this specific part that we've really started to zone in on. And what, what we've seen is that actually almost 50% of all the projects that we've, we've un, unpicked, the real barriers to preventing them being either deployed or scaled is around access to suitable finance, the suitable funding, which can really start to, to implement and to drive those projects. And, and thank you. Um, and through this, what, what we've identified is really four um, different challenges that our whole program is, is looking to, to address. The first one is really around the, the complexity of the cash flow that sits around a blue carbon project. As mentioned by some of our other speakers this afternoon, actually a lot of these projects rely on more than just carbon income streams. They, they often have other, other income streams from ecotourism, um, but, but fundamentally you start with this very highly speculative upfront phase where you're investing in the technical understanding, the creation, the community alignment, the engagement work. And actually that's a very difficult funding program to unlock. And then you move through into these quite long term um, income streams, which um, are underpinned clearly by the um, by these carbon revenues. And, and very interestingly, we also see this potential and given the wider carbon market, very interesting upside potential, where at the moment, a lot of that speculative funding, which is funded through donative capital, often has no relationship to that potentially quite interesting return perspective that achieve, which is achieved much later in the, in the project life cycle. Um, thank you. Um, and through this, what, what we've been seeing is that, that because of the complexity in, in, the, in the cash flows and because of the, the risks to do with the uncertainty of the voluntary carbon pricing, the complexity in assessing the amount of carbon benefit that the projects will generate, and also the actual the, the fundamental costs and, and really critically the fixed costs that these projects face actually makes it very difficult for projects to attract that early stage funding, which is clearly fundamental to unlocking 
these programs and really kickstarting them in the first place. And so the other barrier that we see because of those fixed costs is that actually this really has a, a significant impact on small scale projects. And, and actually it creates artificially high barriers where many of those fixed costs around verification, around the market infrastructure to create these verified credits are very similar to the much larger projects. And so really this incentivizes much larger schemes, but actually what we need to recognize is that lots of the innovation, the, the, the evolution of, these, of the carbon market really is starting with these small scale projects. And, and for us, we think that's really important that we find a mechanism to support those and, and actually starts to, to recognize the value that those small projects represent and, and allow those to then become the pilots of the big projects of the future. And then finally, we also are seeing the, the complexity of the market infrastructure in the blue carbon market and the complexity around the scientific consensus, the, um, the process for verification, and all of these issues are massively exacerbated for small community groups, which often don't have the technical financial capacity and, and actually all of that, even at the point where you do get to the verification phases, is still very difficult for them to actually market these projects and advertise these projects to funders. And so what we're looking to do is to build a system that can start to manage and, and start to um, resolve these, these issues. And so what we're looking to do and, and what we're exploring is the creation of an impact vehicle which mobilizes impact investors that are willing to take a share in that impact upside in a share in the carbon benefits that these projects can create to create a series of blended portfolios which actually helps to align and break down those fixed cost issues and aggregate those smaller portfolios with much larger projects where we can share those costs and more efficiently deliver those programs as well as creating programs of aligned projects that we can use it as advocacy vehicles to help mobilize more, more metrics and more codes that are so fundamental to underpinning the blue carbon market. And so we're right at the beginning of this journey. And um, as Claire said, we've, we've got a session this afternoon and, and to, to explore this. And we really welcome as many people to come to that as possible and really would, would would welcome feedback and thoughts on this. And really what we hope is that this vehicle will not just show how we can deploy patient capital into these really essential projects, but also how we can show that philanthropy, which is often um, used to take the most risk on, actually we can show that there's a way of using philanthropy and give it the opportunity to share in success. So thank you very much for, for your time. Um, really looking forward to the panel session shortly. Thank you. Hello, I'm John Vermeer of the Gallifrey Foundation, Geneva, Switzerland. Let's talk about how to scale blue carbon projects. How do we fix the disconnect between supply and demand? What are the obstacles and how can we overcome them? In 2020, the Gallifrey Foundation published a study called Blue Carbon, Mind the Gap. We found that there were three main obstacles. Number one, designing a project. It's complex and it's expensive. Number two, Projects need seed funding, yet the revenues don't come until three to five years later. And finally, validating the project is expensive and actually no longer fit for purpose. We'll go into detail on that one. One of the other things we found is that about 60 to 80% of the money that goes into a project gets eaten up by the intermediaries and does not, in fact, go to the project itself. So if I have a thousand hectares of mangroves, and those generate one metric ton of CO2 sequestration at $10 a metric ton over 10 years, $100,000 revenue, not bad. But look at this, a quarter of that is already taken up by the design consultants, even more by the validators, less so for the accreditation. Maybe I've got 10,000 to run my project actually on the ground. And if I'm lucky, 10,000 profit, if you will, at the end of 10 years. 
not efficient, not motivating. We also identified in our study that there are four pillars, four things which, if done correctly, will make for a successful project. The first we call legal, or solving the land tenure issues. Also, the rights to carbon credits and how to avoid double counting with the NDCs, the nationally defined contributions of a country. Management, beyond just pure competent project management, this requires good governance, community engagement, and transparency. Financial, solving the gap between the need for seed funding and revenue, but also surprisingly, some projects go ahead and without even assessing whether they will be financially viable at the end of the day. And finally, scientific taking the rigorous scientific requirements of the accreditation process and applying those in the project. Let's have another look at those three areas where so much of the money is taken up. First, project design. These currently use external consultants. It's expensive and doesn't do a lot for building local capacity. The project validation, same issues, external consultants, expensive, and today, it costs tens of thousands of dollars to fly someone in to do a boots on the ground assessment. And therefore, it only happens every three to five years. That does not make sense anymore. And finally, the accreditation process. Yes, they're complex, they're difficult to apply, they take years to achieve. Is there a way to make that easier? So, how do we fix the system? We interviewed lots of projects in preparing the Blue Carbon Mind the Gap study, but we also consulted with our cohort of NGO colleagues and the design consultants, the validators, and the accreditation standards. We're also working with the London Business School, the, the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development, to understand the ramifications of a change to the business model, if you will, of this whole design, validation, and accreditation infrastructure. We have created something called the Fair Carbon Project. This is independent of the Gallifrey Foundation and all the others. And while the Gallifrey Foundation is taking the lead on it right now, we expect that this will be an independent, not-for-profit, self-staining entity over the coming years. Here's where we are today. We're in the proof of concept phase. So we have created online already a platform that will allow us to populate the decision guides and the checklists that are needed to take a project from beginning to end. It's built again around the, the pillars of legal, management, financial, and scientific. There are six modules that take you from beginning to end. More specifically, again, project design. We're taking the best practice and what we know from the successful projects and building that into online guides and decision trees. To support the validation, most importantly, we are requiring an upload of proof of every step of the way. How did you resolve your land tenure? What was your community engagement like? What is your species census look like? Biodiversity, et cetera. All of that gets uploaded so it can be evaluated at a distance. And here's something really important. You know, flying people around the world to go look at a site no longer makes sense when we have truly advanced satellite imagery. Using spectroscopy, we can actually evaluate what species of mangroves are from a single pixel. We also have 40 by 40 centimeter resolution. We can actually assess the health of a mangrove stand from satellite imagery. So rather than going every three to five years, there actually can be continual monitoring of the site that de-risks the project and increases the validity of them. Finally, we are working with the accreditation agencies to simplify the process to these step-by-step -step guides, and also why not translate them into local languages? So what could the new picture look like? Well, we reverse that 60 to 80%, so it goes actually mostly to the project owners. So what was 100,000 to start with might actually end up with 60,000 for the projects at the end of the day. What we're trying to do is to create a brand new infrastructure to completely change the way these projects are designed, validated, and accredited. 
and therefore unlock the supply of blue carbon projects. Mangrove forests are home to hundreds of species of fish, mammals and birds. Human communities rely on mangroves too. Unfortunately, large areas of mangroves have been lost. With the trees gone, coastlines erode and animal populations decrease. However, Mangrove forests are incredibly efficient carbon sinks. Restoring them can create carbon offsets, which can be sold, and profits invested into local communities. The Fair Carbon Project is developing step-by-step -step guides for blue carbon projects. We can bring back mangroves on a massive scale. Find out more at faircarbon.org. The Fair Carbon Project is actually revolutionary. We're changing the way the system works. We're building an infrastructure that allows all the current players to plug in and do what they do best, but making the system far more efficient and usable by the local projects. We hope you understand the importance of this and the potential. And we hope you'll join us, the Gallifrey Foundation, as co-funders as we unleash the potential of blue carbon and beyond. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion. My name is um, Elsa Palata. I'm the Global Head of the Facility and at Bar Bar. I'm not Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, although she is an incredible thinker. And so that's an even, <laughs> it's an honor to see her name up here. Um, I have the difficult and exciting task of bringing together all the amazing presentations we've just heard. And I won't even attempt to, uh, to, to synthesize this, but what I do want to do is make sure that we have the opportunity to have a really dynamic and organic conversation building off of the presentations that we had. Um, first, I might take a moment just to explain why, uh, why I'm here and why I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. Um, Barclays was one of the first banks of its size to set a net zero ambition a little over a year ago. And happily, I can say that many financial institutions and most major banks have, have followed suit and done the same thing. And that's a great point of progress when it comes to the conversation around climate change and what financial institutions need to do to play their part. Um, but I think this conversation around a really robust um, voluntary carbon market, and particularly when we think about uh, the oceans and blue carbon, is a critical part of that conversation. We as financial institutions are absolutely part uh, responsible for our own portfolios. Um, and yet, in order to see the, the real economy move in the way that it needs to and to account for net zero across the full spectrum, we're going to have to make sure that um, we are taking into account these, these voluntary markets and really importantly, leaning in on the role that nature plays and ensuring that we are supporting and boosting um, nature-based solutions when we think about climate change. So uh, Barclays has entered into a partnership with the Blue Marine Foundation. Um, we are really proud of this partnership and really excited to be supporting the incredible work that they're doing. And uh, so that's how I have the great honor of being here and, and talking with all of you. So I think there's a few themes um, of course, that have come out. And I will make sure that I'm making my way through the questions in the Q&A. So I would uh, say to all of the, our attendees out there in, um, in internet land, please be sure to type any questions you have into the Q&A section and I will try and get to them. Um, I think picking up on, on a big theme, there was one big question about governance that came up a couple of times. And I will direct these um, 
to individual speakers if they are sent to you, but I would also please uh, welcome any, any of the panelists to jump in and join into the conversation so that this has a bit more of an organic feel. So starting off in this question around governance, um, I think that we, we heard that, um, that one of the, the biggest challenges here is ensuring that we have, um, we have governance in place and making sure that uh, this is a productively, um, these projects are productively run. So I wanna make sure that we, uh, we get to that question right, straight away. Um, I, um, I won't uh, send this to any individual person, but if I could actually, I think starting, um, sorry, I'm just dealing with the technology here at the same time. Would welcome, um, yes, John, please feel free to jump in. And okay, thank awesome. You. Thank you. Well, it's good we have James Cairo on the line because exactly. I really do think that Makoko Pomoja exemplifies exactly what the issues are. There was community engagement, there's transparency. You can go online and you can see who got paid down to the shilling for the work that they did. Um, and you also, because I've had the pleasure of going to Ghazi and see that you actually see the benefits to the village. There's, there's a water tower in the middle. There's water lines going out to the houses. That's thanks to this project. Now there's a clinic there. They've upgraded the school. So this is what we talk about proper project management. It's not just the scientific, but it's the social. I can come in. Dr. Cairo, thank you. There he is. Thank you so much. I've been following up and uh, Really feel, feel very excited to be here. And I think I now appreciate why we are still the first successful blue carbon project in the world. It's because our Mikoko Pamoja is built on four main, uh, what we call uh, building blocks. Our first big building block is that it's built on science. We understand the value of science, carbon for carbon science. And so, so the Bikoko Pomoja is built on community support, government uh, support, and international partnership. On governance, governance issue, you need all of you together. Community will not work alone because they don't develop project. But a scientist will develop project. He will not implement the project for the long term, as much as we have challenges in our project. So that's why my talk today was on how to keep that momentum. But momentum is affected around by financing, by fatigue, by, but when people see tangible benefit, you're funding the school, there was no water, there was no water in the village, there's water. There was no hospital, there's hospital. People will always have, but that has to be built on transparency, accountability, and that, that are, those are elements of good governance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cairo, that's super helpful. So I think I'd like to get into, we've, we've heard several of you talk about um, scaling projects and the role of uh, the many factors that must take into account um, here. And, and I think there's a couple of questions uh, that I have around, um, around scaling. And I would like to make sure that, I think one question that uh, certainly we have is that we're gonna need to have obviously coordinated action and partnerships on several fronts in order to scale appropriately. Um, thinking about the role of local communities being really critical, the project developers and verifiers, public authorities, and then the private sector all playing different roles in this process. Um, and the private sector, of course, as both a potential sort of end buyer and a funding source. So there's an entire ecosystem built into this. And again, I think we've heard from, from many of you about the different aspects involved in this. I'd love to know um, how this ecosystem needs to come together. This is a really big question, but how might this ecosystem best come together? I think we're going to explore this a little bit later on in some of the breakout conversations. But if folks could tease out some of the major questions at hand or the aspects we need to keep in mind as a global community, um, I'd like to welcome you to, to come in on that. And I think one question somewhat tangentially related to this is there was a question for Torsten here around could an ocean development bank enable an, a global market for blue carbon? 
And um, I think the question is, again, when we think about the role of, we have representatives of government uh, in this conversation today, we have industry in the, the virtual room, how do we start moving these different pieces forward? That was one provocation that was put forward, but would love to hear um, how this ecosystem best works together so that we can make sure we're making progress. Torsten, maybe I'll start with you on that if you don't mind, thank you. You're on mute. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, I've been talking about an ocean sustainability bank or an ocean development bank exactly for purposes like that. I think what we need at the moment, we've heard today, there are lots of really helpful initiatives and components, etc. But the space we are talking about, we are talking as if we're in the tech startup world or something in the world of small equity. The world that I've worked in for decades is the large infrastructure project world. And I think that world is much more appropriate in the medium term where these projects would need to sit because the returns we will get are medium type returns. They are not breakthrough equity type returns, but they can be stable if we put all these components into the structure together. And so in order to do that, to move it to that world of long-term patient natural capital, that is a, becomes an investable asset class for larger scale investors, for institutional partners, it needs to be structured in formats that these investors are familiar with. And the lead we have seen in that space has often come from multilateral development banks. And I believe that we need at the moment this type of lead in the marine and coastal space. We don't have a knowledge hub for ocean solutions, for coastal solutions. We have an alignment of development banks to go beyond net zero to include biodiversity positive, but to implement that is already a big challenge for the existing institutions. By having a new institution that starts with this focus, that builds on that, and that also is very much a public-private partnership institution that does not only have governments as shareholders, but actually has private capital included, would give us a 21st century model of a coastal marine focused infrastructure bank that actually can bring all these different components together, provide the kind of a loan, senior, cheaper financing behind which you get other private financing coming in, but also help organize all these different bits and pieces and everything we heard today is important. I don't think one needs to replace the other. It's really bringing it together and also integrating these solutions into the broader nature-based solutions for infrastructure space. Because infrastructure spending is gonna be huge in any case, if it's done wrong, it'll destroy these coastal spaces. So it needs to be done right. Sorry if that was a bit wrong, but I'm really passionate about this approach. <laughs> That's fantastic, thank you. Yes, Jen, would you like to come in on that please? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I think everything Torsten mentioned just now is absolutely correct. and. I think when it comes to scaling, you know, I don't want to speak for you know Stephanie and, and Dr. Cairo and others, but I think you know when we're looking at these projects, blue carbon finance is a means to drive private investment to conservation and restoration of coastal ecosystems and community benefit. That's what it's for. And so, how do you scale and not lose that community benefit is something that I'm very very nervous about. You know, once you start to nest everything and start going through these jurisdictional approaches or national structures, which absolutely is what needs to happen, I think, to get to scale, um, how do you ensure that that funding gets back into the communities and isn't lost in some sort of uh, hierarchy that, you know, each layer somebody's taking some, you know, to cover their own, their own overhead to get down. And so that's something that I'm very, um, interested in and, and really focused on and, and you know maybe Steve could even talk after me about again his landscape approach with with Vera seascape approach with Vera which I think is really going to be key to scaling the other thing I'll mention too and we noticed this when we tried to get the science for the blue carbon initiative to work with policy is that the policy side was asking us questions we thought we were giving them the right answers and we were really not speaking the same language. And it took a lot of work to align that. And I think the same thing is happening in the finance space. I feel like I get asked a lot, you know, what's the return on investment? You know, 
people talk to me and they throw out all of these uh, finance terms. I think I'm giving them the right answer, but I'm probably not. And so I think that um, it would really help to really focus on not just how do carbon project managers speak finance language, but how do finance managers speak project management. And so I think that that would really help us communicate better and alleviate some of the concerns. And I would be able to communicate that better to the local communities because I would understand more what this deal means. What is this company going to do? And also understand that not all communities want to work with big companies. And so that has to be considered as well. I think that's such an incredibly important um, and very specific point and, and really helps provide a, a helpful pathway. Steve, I wonder if you might like to come in on that at all. Sure, there's a few quick points to make on the follow-ups. You know, I, I've sat, sat in, in meetings with development banks and these folks have had hundreds of millions of dollars. They're looking for projects. They can't find the projects that they have confidence in. And I've just come from meetings with people in communities and in various areas who have got projects and you've got no idea how to talk to people with money. And so there's a, there's a real disconnect here in terms of the communication. And maybe development banks need more, more environmental people in them and the people on the environmental side need more finance people to connect just to have that conversation. Um, certainly, and I think I agree with both Jen and Torsten here, you know, if we're really gonna scale up, it's gonna come from development funding. You know, when we, when we think about all the activities you know, you can do a lot if you're a line item in a hundred billion dollar project or even a billion dollar project. You can do a lot of work. Uh, but at the same time, you know, a lot of development projects are all in very urban areas and, and maybe that's where it's best, uh, best focused. When we think about the pristine parts of the world, you know, the real carbon benefit is in conserving intact ecosystems. The restoration part is a slow recovery, very, very slow recovery, where you can put a lot of carbon back into the atmosphere by destroying intact ecosystems. So where's the development funding for that? You know, it probably is going to be the, 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 finance, the, the carbon finance world in some way. But there are real challenges. You know, there's a reason why most of the projects in the world are restoration projects or conservation projects. You've probably seen the thing in the news about it. Who is it? TNC getting beat up by, uh, by the press over one particular project because there are questions about the baseline. How do, you, how do you develop a projection going forward where there's no impact yet? But you know at some point it will come. You know, so these challenges have to be worked out. So maybe I've thrown in a lot of complexity in there, but I think it comes about, uh, it comes about identifying the condition in the landscape, uh, supporting communication, and, and trying to develop, uh, trying to tackle some of these complex issues. Thanks, Steve. I, I think certainly speaking from a bank's perspective, there's, there's a lot of desire to play a role, as I mentioned, in these markets, but until they're aggregated in a way that where they're, they're essentially bankable or they work within that traditional finance mechanism, and we're not an investor, of course, we're a bank, but there, there is this, this translation effort, Jennifer, to your point, that needs to happen across the spectrum. So I think we're hearing some really practical recommendations now when we think about the tools that are being developed. And so, Tom, I see you, you put your hand up, and, and Jamie, I might like to go to you as well to th think about how this plays into the accelerator, if you don't mind. So, Tom, go ahead first. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I mean, there's uh, people on the panel better qualified to speak from the uh, financing perspective, but I think there are there are some economies of scale that could be found within the projects that have already gone forward. You know, John mentioned those prohibitive setup costs, and if they're shared across three or four countries or three or four projects, maybe that's how they can be better aggregated. But but from a policy side, I actually think it's um, it's relevant to the first question of governance. Uh, one of the things we found in our R and D C projects is that you have a multitude of interests and departments with responsibility over these ecosystems, and that that doesn't engender a huge amount of confidence in, in policy making or financing. So actually clarifying who is ultimately responsible, who is who is getting paid, who is helping develop the capacity, it sounds very simple, but it's it's not necessarily so with these ecosystems. Um, I think the other aspect of governance is, is being clear on the distinction between governance on paper and governance in practice. We found that in, in many places there are uh, fantastic regulatory frameworks, very, very clear uh, management frameworks for these ecosystems. But then when you dive into it, um, who's monitoring them? Who's, who's measuring the changes? Who's feeding that back into that central point of governance? Because when we're talking about climate commitments, we're talking about long-term long -term policy making, but also long-term management. And that infrastructure of, of governance in practice is one where we're doing a lot of thinking about as well. 
I think I'd just like to come in on the back of what Tom was saying there. So totally agree with everything that the panel have been saying. And I think some of the key issues that we see relate to the first question around governance and, um, and particularly the question of governance and how you scale and maintain quality whilst you, whilst you scale. And there's, there's clearly an absolute need to scale as quickly as possible, but that's actually part of where we see some of the risks evolving as well, that, that as these programs and as we do start to build the market infrastructure to scale these projects, that actually the fund flows do get very sizable and without having an appropriate governance structure that then allows buyers and allows investors to sort of appropriately assess what those projects actually do for those local communities, there's a real risk actually that over time that those benefits don't aren't delivered at the same level that they should be. And so a lot of the work that we're, we're trying to unpick and understand with the accelerator development is how do we sort of build best in class? How do we support those projects that really start to sort of shine the light as how do you do maintain quality and create quality? And how do you then best scale those over time? And that's that's the sort of at the essence of, of what the accelerator in many ways is, is trying to, to achieve, whilst recognizing there's a whole range of very complicated market infrastructure mechanisms which are needed to, to sort of grow and develop this market over time as well. Thank you for that. Yes, Dr. Kyra, I think you, your hand is up. Please jump in here. I'm, I'm always more normally concerned when our market stream now seems to be more focused. Uh, the carbon market has more been on voluntary carbon market. Yet we know it, is, it has opportunity, but community will not like only opportunity. They want to see realization. And uh, I've come from the forestry sector and I know the, the compliant market is very rich, but you never reach there. You are always on preparedness. So even as we move the acceleration, I will really, my, my challenge has been how do we cost and pay other cost benefit, other benefits arising from blue carbon ecosystem. For instance, there was one percent of talking about uh, resiliency uh, payment for resiliency credit. But when you come now to the realization of that, that's a potential. But when you come to the ground, uh, the financial will say that's a rock of problem. It's not like carbon, which is international. It has a more international focus because it affects bigger community. But when you come to biodiversity function of a blue carbon ecosystem, you bring the shoreline protection of blue carbon ecosystem. They're huge cost, they have huge value. They, are, they have a market potential. But how do we move from potential to reality? That should be the one thing we should be as, uh, as, a, as a science community, as policymakers, we should be moving forward to look at how do we realize moving away from potential? Potential we have known. How can that poor person in uh, Bangladesh benefit from what you've had, the value of mangrove in the Bangladesh Delta? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's an incredibly important, important flag. Steph, I might link this to you. I think we're on to a really important and really interesting um, line of, of questioning here. And I, I don't want to get off of this issue of connectivity to local um, communities and the governance aspects of this. But I also want to bring in this question of, of stacked credits. I think you brought up some really interesting points around resilience credits. And how do you see this playing a part in this conversation? Could this credit stack be diversified further with other credit types, uh, this idea of increasing biodiversity or um, increasing harvestable fish stocks. I feel like, you know, we're actually adding more, um, more factors than we are taking away here. But I think if this panel can do one thing, it's actually navigating or mapping the full spectrum of issues so that we can all dig into this as a community of practice. So if you don't mind talking a bit about that, that would be great. Thank you. Sure, yes. Um, I mean, that was our really our idea behind looking at this, you know, looking at resilience credits and wanting to quantify this as an asset is, you know, blue carbon is one piece of so many benefits that these ecosystems are providing. Um, and there's always that challenge in trying to connect those benefits with a monetary value. I mean, it's easily to argue that it's, it's really impossible to really assign a true market or, or dollar value um, to these benefits. 
but our attempt is to work with what we have, right? And, and we have a price for carbon. It's not nearly what it should be. Hopefully it, it is going into that direction to, to be uh, closer to what it should be and we're actually represent the benefit um, of, of capturing carbon and addressing climate change. Um, but we saw this, you know, resilience, resilience is a huge benefit also that's in, um, we see a lot of interesting, uh, increasing interest and demand for understanding, you know, nature-based solutions, quantifying this benefit. Um, and so that was, you know, really where the thinking came from. And I've been part of many conversations with many people on this panel over the years about how do we capture the benefit of the resilience uh, benefit that these ecosystems are providing and, and turn that into an additional asset that we can sell or in the very least capture that as a, a verified benefit. Um, Cause that's the other thing that we're hearing from investors is that they want verified benefits. Um, and increasingly, I mean, we talk about the cost of developing these projects and having third party verification and all of that. Um, that's not gonna go away. In fact, I could even see that in increasing because investors wanna know, I mean, we've already mentioned, you know, the kind of the elephant in the room, the, the target that TNC has, has received so far about some of our past projects. Um, investors wanna know that their money is, is really going towards offsets. We wanna be able to provide credible, you know, offsets that are, are backed by, by science. Um, but we're working in a landscape where it's also, it, it's just a, it's, it's a crease, increasing challenge to be able to accurately quantify that, especially as Steve mentioned, when you're looking at, um, you know, avoided deforestation, you're projecting out what you think is going to happen. And arguably that is some of the most important work that we can do is prevent the loss of these habitats before they're lost, because it is so much harder and more expensive to try to, to restore them. Um, but that brings additional challenges with, with meeting those kind of investor expectations. Um, and so I would even kind of use that as a way to, to go back to that original conversation about how we communicate about these projects. Um, I see this the really big need about how we communicate with investors um, and set those expectations about what these projects take. You want really, you know, you want um, good science to back all this. You want a verifiable process that takes cost. Um, and that's the cost that we don't want it to see to come from the community benefits and what the community needs. I mean, the whole purpose of these payments is to provide long-term sustainability for project management, for habitat management, for habitat stewardship um, for communities. So, you know, we, I, for me, I think the real challenge is we have all this interest right now, all this demand for blue carbon. We want these credits quick and fast. Um, in the reality, conservation is not quick and fast, not meaningful conservation. And we're realizing more and more now too that we really need to be, as conservation organizations, the voice of the community. We, I know I definitely feel a kind of protection around the community members that we work with, um, that we don't want them taken advantage of. We don't want voices left off the table, especially indigenous peoples, local communities, marginalized voices. We wanna make sure that those voices um, that they are empowered through this process and, and not left out. Thank you so much for that. I will say, I mean, I think the, the demand for this market is only increasing by the minute, but I couldn't agree more that if you take away the integrity or essentially pull the rug out from under the market, it will do none of us any good and will end up damaging and harming the, the communities in which we're attempting to, to support and really effectively remove this entire mechanism in a way that will not be entirely unhelpful. So I think there's a shared objective there, perhaps coming at it from different angles. Um, but if we can capitalize on that as a community, again, I think there's an opportunity there. Jennifer, I think you wanted to come in, please do. Yeah, just very quickly, I think um, also taking responsibility on ourselves as project implementers and developers, we are really, really bad at putting out there what the actual costs of these projects are. You know, we're NGOs, we're, you know, grant-based funding. So if somebody says, I have this amount of money, can you do a blue carbon project? Sure. Somebody comes along and says, you know, I have a little bit more money. Can you do a blue carbon project? Yes, I can. It just means for the first one, I'm working for free, which I'm happy to do. But I think that um, in general, one of the other struggles around this is what is the actual real cost of these projects? And just looking at budgets from past projects, I don't think is going to give you an accurate view of what those costs really are because, you know, NGOs, and I can speak at least for Seattle, we're very passionate. We'll put the time in, we'll do what needs to be done and we'll make it work. And, you know, I think 
we're starting to think about now, what are those actual costs? How do you start to analyze the real costs of these projects such that we, because you can't address the problem if we're not being honest about what it takes to do it. And so I think just for the implementing community, you know, something we need to be a little bit better about as reporting actual costs, not, you know, here's my budget. So what, how do I make it work for that budget is sort of um, one side of it, I don't think that will go away, but there's a, another side of, okay, but if, but what is the actual cost? How much am I doing now pro bono because, you know, my time wasn't covered adequately or something like that, or, you know, we had to get a budget from one group, but then go get budgets from someplace else, but we're only talking about the one gift or something like that. So I think, I think there's some additional analysis and things that the implementing community can do to also help solve this problem with just being open and honest about the actual cost and not being afraid that it's going to be something that scares away a potential investor. Thank you for that. I think, John, I'd like to make sure you have the chance to come in on that. Thanks. Just a quick one. We cannot forget in our costing the employment that has to be replaced. So the mangrove loggers, the fish farmers, and all the rest that often slips off. These projects will not be successful unless we do that. Simple as that. We have a lot of conversation around a just transition uh, and thinking about the role of, of livelihoods. And, um, and I think this is an incredibly important space because it's easy to forget those that are dependent on the current status quo and the need to bring them along in just that way. Torsten, please come in. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, when we set up the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility, we were very keen to identify multiple revenue streams. Mm -hmm. And so to think around those, and I think in the discussion you saw it in the earlier panel where questions around seaweed, for instance, were mentioned, obviously seaweed is a product <laughs> that's sellable. So it's not just a carbon sink. And um, these are local jobs that get created and there are opportunities around all of these. And, and so it's really important to think how this packaging or this concept of blue natural capital with multiple revenue streams that all contribute can be brought into, into project structures. Please, Steve, go ahead. Thank you. You know, uh, the point about community is very important. You've really got to put the community at the center of your project. And you've got to think about, you know, who's gaining and losing out, who's gaining out of the existing condition and how are they going to be disadvantaged by how things change? And, um, you know, and it's, we've seen, for instance, in various activities, well, let's put it another way, you really have to invest in the community well up front, the work that Cairo was doing, the work that Jen and, and Steph are doing, you know, you've got to get in there years ahead. And when we think about trying to do things in the landscape in the coastal area, for instance, you might be thinking around marine protected areas, you have to go in there for the years ahead and you, you set up the agreements between communities, conservation and national work in West Papua, you know, seven different villages, only a spoken uh, language, there, there's no written agreement. So you have to get the added agreements together and the communities, the, the, the governments above that. And, and you build on that and you build on that. It can be very easy, for instance, for big agencies to come in with lots of money and the communities have no idea how to deal with that because they're just not prepared. And so you have to go through the preparation phase. And one thing I might say to agencies is, Invest in a lot of preparation and that will lead to a good outcome at the end. Don't try and rush in and do something because then you end up with uh, perverse incentives and outcomes that you don't necessarily want. An incredibly important point. Thank you very much. I We could keep going and going and going. This is just the start of it. I think it's an incredibly important conversation. And happily, I think this is exactly the kind of material that we will get into this afternoon in the, um, the workshops. There are many, many more wonderful questions that we haven't gotten to yet, but I think some really good provocations around assistance for developing countries, um, ways to pool capital, ways to pool resources. And so it would be great to get into all of that. I would, John, did you, is there one thing you wanted to say before I, I go through the, um, I'd like to make my way through everyone and have you all offer one more provocation, uh, whether it's on the opportunities or the challenges front. Uh, or both. I think that we're seeing that these are coming together. And if you're going to ask everyone in this virtual room to keep something in mind, I'd like to end on that note so that folks can take that away into the work this afternoon. 
So John, I might actually start with you and anything you might like to share and then add that if you don't mind. Sure. Well, I think what's great is it is the, exactly the collaboration between everybody here on my screen. That's what it's all about. We tend to work in silos and big NGOs, and the fact that we're now working together uh, is immensely beneficial to what we're actually trying to get going. Thank you for that. Steve, I might come to you next. I'm making my way through the little squares. <laughs> um, yes, it's about collaboration. It's about a big tent, and it's about being patient. We need to get going, and once we do get this train going, it'll roll along very nicely, but we need to be patient at the beginning and work together. Thank you. Steph? Yeah, adding on to that, I, I think it's um, a, the real big need is to balance out that sense of urgency and wanting to take advantage of the increasing investor interest with the, the patience and the, the you know, time that is needed to really develop impactful change uh, within the, these communities. Thanks. Jennifer? I think for me, as this field is growing and more and more projects are coming online, it's about what are the minimum standards for high quality. I think if you're not producing high quality credits, it will damage the field. And, um, you know, so high quality that includes, you know, all everything we've talked about today, including community engagement, that quality has to be the top of mind. Thank you. Torsten. Uh, my stress is on the opportunity. In the past, blue carbon was competing against carbon. Now we're talking about blue carbon projects that deliver at the same time on adaptation, on resilience, on biodiversity. Our credits are the Ferraris of the carbon world. They should be priced significantly higher than that average car that we are competing against. And that's the great opportunity. So we need to work with the financial investors to get them to understand that and be part of this. Okay, I'm taking that away. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. They're all the good ones. Um, I would echo <laughs> the point on uh, patience, collaboration, partnerships. Um, I think in the same vein as thinking laterally about financing, it's worth thinking laterally about policy as well. So climate policy is not the only policy that recognizes climate benefits. And there's some, I think, key work to be done in thinking about how other policy frameworks, conservation frameworks can complement the UFCCC as well. Fantastic, thank you. Jamie. I'll yes. Everyone's points as well. Oh, carry on. <laughs> Sorry, I would totally echo everyone's points and and really that that this this urgency that that absolutely faces us. We need to balance that with the need to maintain quality. But I think as a sector, we also need to help educate and work with the investment community as well to work out and agree what what does quality look like. There's there's a lot of definitions around. Um, and actually, I think there's a there's a need for us to help and set those bars and to set those parameters that, that will help and then be replicated elsewhere. Thank you for that. Dr. Cairo, please go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, uh, my, my backing one is uh, avoiding to simplify the carbon project, like what we did during the Bruca, the, uh, the, the green carbon, whereby like now what's all going on is where because of carbon trading, corporate bodies are just coming and planting huge mangrove area. Those are not carbon projects. So we have to look at the holistic, uh, what this ecosystem provide, look at the carbon uh, climate benefit, community benefit and biodiversity benefit. If you look at one, one side, you'll fail. Thank you. Thank you. Claire, I'm, and then Charles, I think, I uh, just think it's all about only connect. We've got to connect between financial institutions and NGOs, between the projects on the ground and, uh, you know, these broader funding mechanisms, policy, science and so on. And um, Charles is probably about to say that we can't save the world on an empty stomach. <laughs> I hope so. Too. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you there? I don't know you manage. manage so much into such a short, short session and getting everybody to conclude that way um, has taught me a lot of things. I mean, the Ferrari um, uh, analogy is uh, uppermost in my mind, Torsten. Um, Elsa, thank you very much indeed um, for your uh, chairmanship and, and, and that fantastic session. Um, I, I need to thank uh, Charles, uh, James earlier on 
and our wonderful speakers uh, and give some housekeeping. Um, we're now taking one of the shortest breaks I've ever known for lunch uh, until 2 p.m. Um, there are some instructions because, of course, you'll be coming back on a different link. For those on Zoom, this webinar will close and we will rejoin for the afternoon in a new session with a different link. The link can be found in your joining instructions. So please join promptly at 2 p.m. Um, BST so you can uh, be allocated to a breakout room. Um, I think you will find uh, the first half hour we're going to be taking you on a on a filmed whistle stop tour around the most important habitats for blue carbon with a range of short video reports from key specialists so you can bring sandwiches. Um, this will be introduced however by Professor Callum Roberts um, from Exeter University who's a, a, a a highlight um, who will give it all a historical perspective. Callum will ask if whether uh, when setting our ambitions we're actually starting from the right baseline and whether we could achieve more. Right now we must say goodbye to our YouTube viewers watching live. If our friends on YouTube wish to see Callum Roberts and the short video reports this is available to view now on Blue Marine Foundation's YouTube channel. Uh, for those wishing to catch up on this morning's sessions, we will endeavor to get a new YouTube link up on Blue Marine Foundation's YouTube channel by this evening, UK time, to uh, get over the glitch we had uh, with the YouTube channel beginning streaming this morning, which uh, was annoying, but we will catch up with it. For those of us rejoining on you on zoom using your second link i must emphasize you must find your other link we will see you at 2 p.m thank you so much